XFM as we work towards the unveiling of Budget 2022. Welcome to the show. Uh, we are also live on Facebook. If you'd like to catch us there, we are at Tracks FM Official uh, for your sneak peek into what's happening with myself and my guests. And also, of course, uh, your chance to post your comments and also questions for our guests uh, all throughout today's proceedings. Yeah. So speaking of guests, let me welcome them into the studios of Tracks FM now. First up, we've got... Ng Yin Sin, who is the founder and CEO of the Center for Research, Advisory and Technology, otherwise known as CREATE, as well as Associate Professor Noor Adli Rizwan Shah Muhammad Dali, who is from the Faculty of Economics at Mamalat, uh, University Science Islam Malaysia, USIM. Yeah? Uh, thank you so much to both my guests for coming in today. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you so much for taking time out to be with us. In fact, for the entire duration as we talk about budget expectations. Of course, when we uh, also will be listening to what's happening in Parliament a bit later mm -hmm. and uh, in the suing post-budget discussion as well, right? So thank you so much for your time, a lady and also gentlemen, yeah? Now let's get right down to business, yeah? So this is going to be the first budget that's going to be under the purview of our Prime Minister, Dato Sri Ismail Sarbi Yaakob, mm -hmm. and his uh, leadership-led government. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So this budget is very crucial, especially in driving his government's efforts to continue to protect lives and also to restore livelihoods, rebuild businesses, and catalyze post-pandemic reforms. That's another key to this whole 3R concept. Yeah? So, so many expectations amongst different walks of life, different Malaysians, uh, in line as well with the Keluarga Malaysia spirit that was recently unveiled, yeah? So how can we as a whole expect this budget to help Malaysians to ease back, bounce back from all the previous setbacks that we've had? I know it's a big question, but maybe just some uh, key thoughts. Uh, Yinsin, maybe you'd like to start, yeah? <clears throat> all right. Thank you so much, Kong Yu, for um, having me back to this um, budget discussion. Well, I think for this year, uh, similar to all previous years, everybody expects the government to be a big Santa Claus every time, you know, mm. during this time of the year. Mm -hmm. But um, Santa Claus being Santa Claus, you know, there's also limitation to how big the bag is going to be and who will be the eventual recipient and beneficiaries of whatever handouts the government is going to um, give to the people um, as it will be announced later. But I think the fundamental um, question or the values that we all would need to consider is how far can the ringgit stretch? Mm -hmm. okay, whoever will receive the ringgit, how far can that stretch? And whether whatever is going to be given to a particular group of recipients is going to make fundamental shift and fundament fundamental change to that particular group of people, be it the businesses, be it the B40 or you know the B10, we, we don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, most importantly, what I personally would like to see is what are the fundamental changes instead of short, very short-term measures? Mm -hmm. It's like a one-off thing. Mm. So because one-off thing can really do so much. Right. It, it makes you feel really good, right. but it doesn't bring about fundamental changes and improvement. That's right. Yeah. And then one key part is actually where we see the difference in the allocation you know, in between uh, the, the two R's, the first two R's, which is to basically you know, get everybody back on track, right? But also keeping in mind the third R, which is basically to uh, you know, reform Right, uh, on a more medium to longer term uh, thing, right? So I think that's where you're coming from mm -hmm. as yeah. well. So maybe more emphasis on how we can catalyze reforms as opposed to just continuing on on aids and stimulus and things yeah. like that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Prof, what yeah, about? I mean, I mean, yes. short term measures mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. help, mm -hmm. but short term measures can only solve immediate um, solutions. Can yes. only solve immediate problem, um, like maybe just a one off. Right. But it doesn't bring about fundamental changes. I mm -hmm. think fundamental changes and fundamental improvement mm. is something that we really need to be looking at moving forward. That's right, right? But of course, we have to keep in mind as well, yeah, that it is an annual budget. Yep. So how much emphasis do we see with the 2022 allocation per se uh, in context of what you just said? So that's going to be an interesting balance there. Prof, okay. uh, your initial uh, thoughts. I'd like to add mm. to what call it, uh, you said, uh, what call it, uh, Mm. Introduction remarks just now. Right. So basically, when, when we talk about fundamental changes okay, in the economy, mm -hmm. we have to uh, plan in me medium term and also the long term. So uh, from my from my my opinion is that when we are looking at the budget twenty twenty two, it's actually a short term measures, mm. short term measures. But this this short term measures must be aligned to the RMK twelve. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also the uh, wawasan kemakmuran bersama 2030 mm -hmm. so which is the long term plan mm -hmm. so uh, what we can see okay, this is what we will be listening from the announcement okay, in a few uh, 
uh, maybe uh, hour is uh, how the government can actually um, improvise or achieve the longer term uh, plans okay but at the same time they have to also um, uh, maneuver okay and and also solve the problem of the short term for example uh, let's say we look we have this the b10 b20 b30 b40 issues okay mm. so which are uh, we call it the um, poverty level is very very uh, i mean uh, high right now in in, in malaysia mm -hmm. it's about 5.6 percent in 2020 and i think it will be increasing to eight percent okay in in uh, this coming years mm. so basically we have to tackle that okay problem okay we don't want because yeah one of the issue of uh, sdg sustainable development goal which is a global uh, <coughs> I'll uh, call it uh, initiative to ensure that everybody, okay, have the same uh, access, okay, to uh, income, has that same access to everything. So equality is there, mm. right? So we want to have uh, inclusivity, okay. So we don't want one, we we'll call it um, uh, one group of people will be left in our uh, economic development. Mm -hmm. okay, this is where I think it's going to be very interesting between, yep. I, I, I understand it as of now, mm -hmm. uh, some of the opinions of uh, the Rakyat overall, and even I think between you two, <laughs> <laughs> Yinsin and also yeah. Prof, I think you're coming from a slightly different perspective. So it's going to be interesting because it's never easy when you talk about a total budget. Yeah. There's just so many aspects to it. Yeah, But Prof, you said it also, you know, the mm -hmm. one consideration is, you know, we've got to stay in line with the uh, 12 MP, right? The 12 Malaysia plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also, like I said, the, the, even though we're talking about annual budget, but this is going to be the f the catalyst towards the key reformations that we're talking about mm -hmm. that's needed to, uh, you know, shape our economy towards mm -hmm. in line with the 12 Malaysia plan and also mm -hmm. for the shared vision 2030 as well. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So this is going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. Overall, what measures can be expected under this budget to ensure uh, that there is still that portion, right, that is dedicated to the recovery plan, the NRP per se, mm -hmm. how much do we need to emphasize that aspect of it? Yeah. Okay. Your thoughts? Uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, <laughs> Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, for the, for, <coughs> okay, uh, in, in the, um, uh, in a nutshell, right? so basically, uh, this budget, I think they will be focusing on three things, okay? The first one is about COVID, right, for the resilience, okay, COVID measures and so on. The second one is in terms of the recovery plan, all right? So how to make sure that the uh, businesses, okay, the uh, the um, the uh, small medium uh, industries uh, can actually <coughs> uh, recover, okay, from the COVID nineteen uh, uh, problem. Mm -hmm. And the third one is the socio economic okay issues, mm. okay. For example, helping the uh, needs okay the need is okay to 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 survive okay uh, to to make sure that can they can actually uh, move forward okay in in the uh, future so uh, when we talk about recovery plan okay recovery plan so in 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 reforming the economy okay we have this ir 4.0 we have the digitalization digitalization the 5g's and so on so we see that there will be a radical change, okay, radical change in the structure of the economy, mm. okay, in terms of how the economy will work, okay, in the coming future. Uh, well, we, we have seen the changes, for example, me, myself in the university, okay, we are now, okay, teaching online, okay, to our, to the, the, the I mean, our students. So basically, uh, these are some of the changes that we are uh, facing, okay? mm. we're embracing right now. And I'm not actually uh, an online user. I mean, I'm an online, uh, what do you call it, uh, users for before the pandemic, uh, COVID-19. Okay. But after the pandemic, mm -hmm. so we have to be, we have to be uh, like a, an expert in that, in that particular area. Mm. Okay? Because uh, all the, we call it, uh, teaching, learning, is uh, are conducted uh, online. So, the same thing for the uh, overall economic structure, okay, we will see there will be a shift, okay, from how we do business and how we actually transform, okay, a normal business to become more towards the, uh, uh, what we call it, the new norms, uh, economic. Right, to be more business. online. More online, uh, more gig economy, right? right so yes. more gig economy. And that too, yeah. So, so, mm. so there will be like a lot of things that might be, mm -hmm. okay, 
uh, might be uh, allocated okay into that area mm-hmm. all right and that's the thing that's that's the key question as well you know how much emphasis of course the emphasis is there but yeah. how much uh, in terms of allocation and numbers can we in a way afford right uh, to make sure that uh, the national recovery plan does drive the economic recovery and at a yeah. practical level as well yeah, yeah, it has yeah. to work that's the key thing isn't it so any any thoughts on that Yinsin? well um i would like to have a slight spin off um from what uh, you know i would have been spoken about it's that we talk a lot about recovery but if i if I speak for the SMEs and the SMIs, mm. the business community, who will, um, you know, in actual fact, recruit the rest of the population mm-hmm. and, you know, be, be the paymaster. We first need to ensure that businesses survive or able to revive. Mm. Okay. And that's the recovery that we're talking about. But as a business owner, if the business owner doesn't have cash to roll. They have cash flow issues. They can't, be, they can't pay rent. They are not getting enough workers. Foreign workers have, you know, the, the opening of the, the, the rehiring of um, foreign workers is not exactly uh, um, open up, or have not exactly been opened up except mm-hmm. the agriculture sector, the, the, the 2000. Then how are we going to ensure that businesses can make a comeback? First is a cash flow. Second is uh, their employees the workers, whether they are skilled, unskilled, foreign or domestic, there is a crunch, mm. a dip in um, job gap that we saw over the last 18 months. So I think that for government to ensure that the recovery plan can can take place effectively or can be real, okay, mm. um, besides giving out cash or assistance to businesses, whether they are big or small, medium or whatever, I think it is time for the government to re-look at how we can bring down establishment costs, bring down the cost of doing business, simplify the red tapes, bureaucracies, procedures to get something going and take away the non-tariff measures. Mm. For example, like the non-monetary um, restrictions that can speed up and facilitate businesses to come back to be more cost effective mm-hmm. because I think the barrier to entry is one uh, for some industries. The barrier and the establishment or I would call them cost of business mm-hmm. in this country is actually quite high, quite high right. compared to other nations. Right, right. So I think one of the things that government can do also in this budget mm. because budget is really more than just giving up money. Mm-hmm. So how can we actually tweak our policies and improve the business environment mm. and the job of the government i feel is to ensure that the ecosystem is business friendly whether it's encouraging domestic reinvestment or to welcome more fdis coming back to the country right i think all this will ensure that our businesses and our people mm. can recover um, properly yeah FDIs, that's going to be a key, right? So that's mm. part of uh, our discussion today as well, you know, mm. um, which are the best ways to actually attract back the FDIs, uh, ASAP, like, essentially. Mm-hmm. Of course, one of the key uh, tenets to that, fundamentals, is, of course, uh, political stability and so on. So we'll get uh, to that when we when we come to the question later on. Now, overall, right, that's also a key thing, isn't it? If we could just demand sums to fall from the, th- <laughs> the heavens, right, that... that that would be the, the, the magic pill. But we know that it's not going to work that way. And are we expecting another record-sized budget compared to already the $322.5 billion announced for 2021? And that was actually looking at things from a fairly optimistic point of view, right? At that point in time in October of last year, right? So what's your thoughts on that in terms of the actual budget size itself? Prof? Okay, for mm. last year budget, I thought it was uh, a little bit smaller than what I've expected mm. because I, were, I was expecting that it goes up to maybe 400 billion at a particular time because, ah. because of the COVID and all that. Okay. But uh, nevertheless, okay, for this year, okay, the, the, the budget might be uh, hovering around that, uh, that figure. Mm. Right, right, that figure, because we we are looking also what I call it a uh, deficit, mm-hmm. not a deficit for Malaysia. So which is... Um, it is actually like uh, normal for other countries to have deficits, but 
but uh, to have a high deficit uh, continuously will be not good for the economy uh, because this will be like an uh, debt okay will be converted to debts okay when you have deficit then That's you right. have to get uh, what we call it the uh, sources to finance the the deficit right so normally we use debts okay from local and also from foreign so uh, it is 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 better to to get from the uh, local okay for example from glcs and so on mm -hmm. however uh, the next generation will have to be uh, the the the, the payback time they, they have to pay yeah that's right, right? we make the the debt mm -hmm. they have to pay mm -hmm. so it's not good right so uh, basically here when we talk about the uh, this year budget i believe it will be a bit around that three, maybe 300 to 350 okay okay mm -hmm. but it sh we should not be consistently on a very high deficit for a uh, long uh, time prolonged long period for yeah. sure yeah right. uh, any yeah. any thoughts on the, the actual amount do I look like Tunku Zafro? <laughs> 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 now, anyway, um, mm. I think based on the reports and all the speculations, uh, you know, over the last one week, I think the MOF also sent up hint mm. that it's going to be a bigger one compared to last year. Right. But as to what amount, I wouldn't know. We all will know, you know, in, well, in a half an hour. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll know in about 4 p.m. So we expect a, a larger budget even. Yes, um, definitely. Bear in mind, of course, what Prof was saying, like, you know. Yeah, I mean, you can only it, roll over... Yeah, but and, and I, I think I think the deficit, uh, will be as high as during the financial crisis time. Yeah, I, 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 I think I think it's going to move towards uh yeah. towards that. We have a high deficit last year. Right? Yeah. Right? But this year will be an, an, another high. That's yeah, right. High. Okay, it will but, be higher. I think. Okay, mm. but uh, it will be uh, maybe it's about six percent. I think. Yeah. It will be. We had we had a recent numbers as high as seven point uh seven point seven I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, you, as the first half of the year I believe. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and then of course uh, with the slight recovery in the middle portion of the year, but then you got to contrast that against what's been happening in Q three, which is. Mm -hmm. Not very positive, lah. Mm -hmm. To 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 put things in perspective, but a mm -hmm. more positive Q4. So it's gonna be a, a lot of plus and minuses as we uh, account for the entire year per se. Uh, speaking of accounting, of course, last year in the last budget, the healthcare sector was the largest beneficiary, rightfully mm -hmm. so, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Despite, uh, Prof, you were saying, federal government's debt rising to sixty one point two percent of GDP, uh, and also statutory debt level at fifty six point eight percent as of June of this year. Mm -hmm. Uh, 2021, yeah. Uh, do you, lady and gentlemen, do you feel that healthcare will still remain a top priority or it is maybe, uh, you know, somewhat of a less priority this year? You see, when we say that um, healthcare has gotten the largest chunk of last year's budget, I think uh, we should also look at the breakdown of the entire healthcare budget, mm -hmm. whether it's in procurement, mm -hmm. whether, you know, the procurement to buy vaccines, to buy mask for the frontliners and all that uh, or it is more in the development budget to um, upgrade our hospitals uh, you know improve the ICU condition or are we spending it on what do you call that um, to pay for the doctors and the nurses mm. so I think we need to look one level deeper or two levels deeper to see um, the sizable budget um, how, how has it been spent and, and I think that can be found in the breakdown of every ministry's budget, but of course the public may not have, mm -hmm. the, you know, the privilege of getting into that detail. Okay. Yeah. Well, where do you see should be the emphasis uh, in healthcare amongst those categories that you mentioned? I think development is very important. Mm. I think for for any budget, if we spend too much on procurement and direct expenses, although yeah, there there is a need to do so, but that then that would mean that the rest of the infrastructure not only the hardware infrastructure but the software which is the talent the people mm. may be neglected mm. and we have to remember that um covid is re covid yes is important is affecting lives around the world economy everything literally everything but we still have to remember that there are a, a lot of other diseases uh, that needs the attention for example patients um, i heard of patients who who have been deprived of their primary care simply because uh the ICU has been taken up right. by um, their resources. Uh, COVID, COVID, focus. COVID patients. That's yes, right. towards so, COVID. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So mm -hmm. people who have been suffering, uh, you know, by uh, people who have been suffering um, other diseases may not get what's 
um, what's due to them, mm-hmm. you know, within the public healthcare sector. And I think that's not fair. Um, I think I think that that part needs to um, be re-looked at. But of course, you know, during this pandemic, I think all attention um, have been given to COVID patients. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so a, a, a better balance on that okay. will be will be um, ideal. Okay, yeah, and I think you, you you struck on the nail there as well. Overall, I mean, for a country like Malaysia, we must not forget that development is really the fundamentals here. Right. I mean, of course, we've been shaken by COVID and we're reacting to it. It has been ever since Budget 2021. But this is where we need to, you know, sort of like ground ourselves back again. You know, we are a developing country. So yeah, <laughs> the yeah. anchor of the budget should be towards development expenditure mm-hmm. overall and, and maybe even minimizing some of the OPEX uh, yeah. that I think for a country like ours is usually seen as quite big la, <laughs> in yeah. my layperson's perspective. Yeah. Um, SMEs, of course, mm. uh, this is a topic that uh, I spoke to my guests yesterday quite passionately about, right? Because 41% of our GDP is actually uh, derived from SME activities, yeah? micro businesses or self-entrepreneurship, actual SMEs themselves functioning as businesses, factories and so on, right? So uh, the emphasis on SMEs is usually there, but unfortunately, I think in terms of implementation, even not considering the whole COVID situation here, yeah, Prof, and also Yin Sin, that sometimes, you know, there's still that gap, you know, that we need to fill up, yeah? Uh, budget 2021 started to bring much hope to SMEs and also e-commerce startups, the emphasis there. And we know that in Malaysia, SMEs play a crucial role, like I was saying. Some of the sectors also greatly affected by COVID, tourism, retail, mm-hmm. uh, uh, other medium-sized enterprises. So what are the overall expectations towards this particular group. I mean, there is the context of the three ALA, right? the, 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 the rebuilding recovery, and also the important reform part of these badly affected tourism and other SME-related sectors. What are your thoughts? Prof, well, let's start well, well, This is a very difficult question. <laughs> Basically, mm. For example, tourism, right? Mm. It's really, really being affected uh, badly okay, during the uh, COVID-19. You know, uh, hotels, uh, we call it logistic, uh, uh, when tourism companies, and uh, even people want to perform the Hajj and Umrah also cannot uh, actually do or perform the Hajj and Umrah. So basically, uh, this is a very big problem. But uh, in terms of the recovery plan for this uh, industry, for example, there might, okay, might be uh, uh, some initiative from the government to assist them. Okay, by uh, having them uh, ability eh, to increase productivity and also to, to ensure that their uh, working capital requirement and also the, um, uh, the, uh, the ability to survive. Okay? Because when you want to survive, you must actually be able to cover your fixed costs. Okay, so during the 18 months or almost two years, okay, so they have difficulties on covering fixed costs. Fixed costs can be from uh, rental of the uh, buildings and also for, for your labor. Mm. Okay, so for hotels to ensure that they can pay their workers is actually a very difficult uh, thing to do. Right. Okay, because they, they don't operate, okay, they, they can't operate uh, like a full capacity, but they still have to pay their, their employees. But Last year, they have this, what I call it, the uh, wages, okay, subsidy, okay, mm-hmm. or a wages subsidy, which is actually uh, helping these uh, companies. But still, okay, but still, eh, um, the tourism industry needs something that might be um, uh, giving them a booster, lah, mm. okay, uh, a kickstart, okay, kickstart for them to, to go back. Because... Uh, I believe that many, okay, for example, small hotels, budgets, they have been sold, okay, because they can't operate, okay, and then uh, even the uh, small operators of homestays, mm. okay, they also have uh, difficulties for, 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 for two years, okay, all right. Now, if the hotels or the, 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 the we call it the uh, tourism industry is actually playing a part when, when, when they know that, okay, when the uh, economy is booming and they're safe, okay, uh, sufficient enough to face the uh, pandemic then it's okay but to the, the 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 time period okay of this COVID 19 is quite long mm. right it is more than one year right so it's very difficult for one business or that's one right small business yeah to sustain okay mm. one whole year or more than one whole year 
uh, without any what call it yeah. uh, income. That that's yeah. the thing. I mean, it's always going to be. I think for this uh, uh, particular case as well, you talk about tourism, right? Yeah. It's going to be a, a, a mixture of both. You're going to have to have the actual act uh, recovery aid, shall we say? Mm-hmm. But yeah, within the context of what I think recently uh, Yin Sin also mentioned mm-hmm. uh, in a discussion that we had, isn't it? Sometimes it's time for consolidation. Uh, maybe some things just don't work. So the, the pandemic has really pushed that. Like uh, if a business isn't able to sustain uh, from a cash flow basis, right, up to two years, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, one plus years, let's say, okay. then something is probably not quite running that efficiently with the business to begin with. Mm-hmm. Right? Similarly with the tourism sector, isn't it? So I think there's also that opportunity to also realign mm-hmm. and make those reforms, which is, part of the, which is one of the R's or the three R's, isn't it? Yep. That's where we need to uh, try to see how we can actually put that focus there that is not just about giving a lifeline, but it's actually about completely transforming and reforming the sector and the products mm-hmm. as well, right? Yes, Sin? correct. I mean, mm. uh, businesses who have been affected will hate us for saying this or even think about it. But um, a strategic thing to do mm. would be exactly what you have just said. If you shouldn't be there, then don't be there. Because there is just so much that the government can bail out. So mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. when the uh, resources are limited, the approach has to be very targeted. The beneficiaries have to be very targeted and they need to be the one that have a promising future. Mm-hmm. Because we, we cannot be just, you know, giving crumbs to everybody because if you give crumbs to everybody, everybody go hungry. So uh, we may need to, you know, decide mm. who gets what based on potential, uh, based on track record or, uh, I, I don't know, the right. government will have to, will need to have that consideration. Right. Uh, what, what kind of um, factors will, mm. will then determine who gets what. Talking yeah. about which, right, this is a good point as well. So this is, um, with, uh, I'm not an expert in this field, so maybe um, with the two of you, you could share with us what types of incentives or assistance they're talking about that could do that, which is to ensure that businesses can stay resilient in facing uh, whatever crisis that we've had to face, but also enabling post-pandemic innovations. What type of incentive proper? Any examples can share with us? I think, I think um, perhaps some merger can be encouraged mm. because they're just very simple economics. I sell nasi lemak at the roadside. You sell curry puff at the roadside. He sells fried banana. But we have three different stalls. Three, three different stalls mm. selling one product, mm. similar product, right. targeting the same um, market. Uh, market. Mm. But we have three sets of operating costs. Mm. So if three of us can merge mm. and make this, make one stall slightly bigger, we pick who has the best stall, best location, consolidate our resources, one stall, um, three co-owners selling three products, and we share. Mm. Maybe, maybe that that's that's the right thing to do. That's right. Then to occupy, take up three spo- uh, stall mm. space and have you know three three kitchen, three three workers, yeah. and all that. So right. to to bring down the cost of doing business, sometimes mm. it's also about working with others, um, building alliance. Maybe mm. that that could be something very simplistic. Of course, it's a very simplistic um, example, but uh, that's one of the way that can be done. And how can we right. be more efficient? Right. We can also sell online, right? Mm, mm. So going online is one way. Uh, merging. Uh, and oh yeah, by the way, and, and I, I do expect a lot of M&A happening next mm. year as well. Mm. Um, even uh, beyond the SME, SMI, but also at the public, you know, the public listed company space. Right. Those who have been public, di- uh, you know, who have gone public because they just cannot survive. Uh, survive. Yeah, interesting thoughts. Sir. So we'll, we'll see uh, that that mm. trend is uh, proven. Uh, as it unfolds, right? Prof, any, any ideas what sort of, you know, ways, methods, uh, types of uh, even assistance that the government okay. could churn out, right? In terms of doing exactly okay, this. Okay, I'm going back to the mm. economic fundamental. Mm. Okay, economic fundamental, if you look at the uh, economic growth, okay, economic growth, so you look at the um, the equation, okay, the equation. So basically, we have this uh, capital, Okay, we have labor, mm-hmm. and also we have another function which is the technology. Okay, technology. So capital we can get from uh, whether it's actually from uh, local or also foreign. So we are talking about FDI. Mm-hmm. So we want this capital to be coming in. We we want also the uh, local capital also to be pouring into the economy. 
and then labor labor forces right so we need to have these labor forces and we need to reduce the unemployment uh, rate and the third one would be the technology so basically if you talk of this why we need the technology uh, factor here is that because it actually it will improve the economy uh, we call it uh, productivity all right so economy uh, technology comes can comes from digitalization ir 4.0 and so on so uh, Talking about the fundamental of this, okay, so probably okay, most of the incentive, okay, might be almost the same as the previous years. Uh, we call it the um, transformation of our economy. So it will be uh, more or less. We'll be trying to transforming the eco- the business mm-hmm. to uh, dig- uh, become a digital uh, or e-commerce, okay, uh, and also trying to prepare themselves for the gig economy. So. Uh, and when we when we talk about trying to be efficient, right? So when you include technology in 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 your company, basically it will increase increase the productivity level of the uh, employees of the company itself, right? Mm-hmm. So it will reduce the cost, okay? Mm-hmm. So such as uh, you seen just uh, mentioned just now. So basically, you have three, okay? You have three small businesses, but these three small businesses can actually have one platform. That's right. That actually selling the the what you call it the. That's right. Because you'll uh, be you'll be saving on the rental. Um, you'll be yep, merging yep, your yep. manpower together. Yes, yes. yes. Mm. So so that can be done easily with the yep. application of technology. Yeah. Right. So tech will be a, a uniting factor line in this case. Yep. I also feel that uh, this is where I think it will actually be. Uh, maybe a game changer in terms of uh, the the relevant uh, the connections and the communication between mm-hmm. the business itself and also mm-hmm. to the relevant agent or agency mm-hmm. that's in charge overall uh, in providing assistance or maybe to to have you know whatever teachings or transfer technology and all that yeah but but there will be challenges mm. okay, for the that's two, two major oh, challenges mm-hmm. uh, for the government okay for the first one is to reduce the uh, digital gap. Yes, between the rural and also the uh, urban areas. Exactly. So we have a very large digital gap. Okay, for for students in in Sabah or Sarawak. Yes. Have having to, I mean, to climb the trees just to get. Uh, Correct. Uh, that which is not acceptable, right? Yes. Recently, also, I mean, uh, we also featured right on the show mm-hmm. um, a, a lady who is very passionate about teaching, mm-hmm. and she has to be the 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 what do you call it the medium point between actually. You know, getting online mm-hmm. and then getting the information back to her students in mm-hmm. uh, in the area that is more rural, but mm-hmm. she's from. You know, okay. So you're right, absolutely. That right. big gap, okay, that has to be really addressed. And then the second one is actually the gap, okay, the digital gap between the uh, what we call it the uh, age factor, okay, the younger generation mm. compared to the, the um, older generation or what we call it experienced generation. Mm. So there, there's a, a what we call it a, a gap there, okay, between these two generation so the younger generation they don't have any problem with digitalized uh, or e-commerce or whatever right but the older generation so there will, there will be a gap so how do actually the the transfer of knowledge of how to actually uh, using it okay to apply uh, to 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 use the um, technology uh, application can be uh, teach eh? okay uh, or train mm. to the older generation. So yeah. that's one one thing. That's the thing. I think it's in that case, you know, a lot of it has to just be uh, it's a change of mindset and attitude, mm. lah. That we do need to get everybody on board and mm. to have the mindset that no one should be left out. Yep. Uh, <laughs> anecdotally, you know, I can think about a few people in my life, yeah. uh, even maybe one or two that's in in the, in the station that used to have this mentality that mm-hmm. you know i'm not a tech person mm-hmm. so i don't need to be on facebook and all that but mm-hmm. even that has to change mm-hmm. you have to be no matter what your age is and no matter what segment of society that you're mm-hmm. from right yeah. so it's a mindset more of maybe that's what the key lies not so much of a budget factor mm-hmm. but perhaps more like there should be a campaign targeting that we should all be tech savvy regardless of what mm-hmm. age group that we're at yeah but here's the thing there's so many Components and even our prime minister himself has said that budget 2022 is from the people, by the people, for the people, and also high impact, taking into account the whole uh, idea concept of Keluarga Malaysia and with that wow mm-hmm. factor. So, are we should we be expecting all of these? And and how would that even, you know, in in the context of our discussion so far, there's so okay. many aspects that we need to give emphasis on. So now then, there's this whole idea of 
eight for the B40, M40 mm-hmm. groups. And then also the PM also said that budget 2022 will be also disabled friendly, which is a mm. much welcome thing. But how can we actually, you know, make sure that this works or can work? Well, firstly, what is a wow factor? Lah. Okay. Like, wow, the budget is so big. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, like, I mean, yeah, so, you, would, you would think that it would be that, right? Okay. <laughs> so probably it's going to be big, right? It would, probably it's going to be big. Wow. Right? <laughs> like, <Okay>. wow. <laughs> yeah. So mm. uh, when we talk about that, okay, okay this is actually like, um, okay, uh, we, because it's, you mentioned just now, that uh, the budget will be taking care of the the B forties, right, and the family, right. So which is the 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 new things here right now? But I was actually uh, been talking about family, for example, in terms of financial planning or whatever. Right? So basically, this is the thing that we need to um, to popularize, okay, right now. Because, for example, if we talk about financial planning, okay, financial planning. Uh, the only the uh, leader or the husband only be talking about the budget for the family okay but okay we need to actually include right the wife okay the children okay in the budget so the the leader must be transparent okay what is your budget okay for this year what you you will be spending mm-hmm. okay are you spending on you know the men, what are you spending more on golf or what? Right? So you need to present, okay, your um, family budget, okay, okay, every year to your wife and children so that they can understand, right? So if 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 the 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 what you call it the the uh, the national budget is also looking at that perspective. Okay. So basically, we need to have that. To be transparent, everything must be transparent. It's just like that, okay? Mm. Transparent, and everybody must know. Mm. Okay, what are you spending? Okay, what are you? How much you are getting? Okay, uh, do you spend it rightly? Right. So this is very important. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so it must be transpired also to the family level. Okay. Okay, the family level, which is we. Which yeah. means you mean uh, it, it more details to be spelt out, spelt out within the budget, or maybe yeah. some of the addendums to it. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, not quite sure what they are officially called, mm-hmm. but that's how I would put it. And also, I think I think a large part of it is the implementation that's important, yeah. Uh, yeah. right? So sometimes I think we as uh, you know people were not first hand into how the budget is distributed mm-hmm. per se. Mm-hmm. Once twenty twenty two comes around, so mm-hmm. it is really that implementation that's important, yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, in terms of encompassing aid for so many different diverse groups, Yinsin, what are your thoughts? Well, then I would say it's politically friendly, but of course that's the right thing to do. Whether it's disabled friendly, young people friendly, old people friendly, mm. uh, it's just about um, sharing the pie. But what mm. I am more interested in is where where will be the revenue coming from, mm-hmm. the percentage of um, expenditure budget, mm-hmm. develop uh, the ratio for expenditure budget, development budget, mm-hmm. emoluments. Okay, mm-hmm. those are the key things that we need to look at. Mm-hmm. But I think from uh, from the right yet perspective, what we are feeling right now is inflation is actually quite high. We actually feel it on it, you know, in our day-to-day right. uh, daily lives. Daily life, what we, what we but, spend but, on but and from purchase. But data, data, inflation yep. is quite low at the moment. Yeah, data. The data is quite low. Inflation yeah, when no, during, during COVID. Da- da- data uh-huh. is what, I don't know who collects the data, where uh-huh. the data comes from. But what uh-huh. I'm saying is that as... As the lead, example, I mean, e- e- yeah, as, as we, a, we go to the market. Yeah, you we go know. to the market, you yeah. buy your chicken. Yeah. Mm. How much per kilo? You okay. buy your kangkong, how much right. per kilo? But when, when we talk about the income, okay, income of the uh, the, the uh, nation. So basically, we have from direct income, uh, so and also we have also from the indirect income. So the majority of the income is from the uh, taxes, okay? So if you want to increase tax, that will be... A, actually not popular I, I don't think okay. I don't think the government is looking at increasing or in, okay. introducing any taxes okay. I think yeah. the Minister of Finance have already yeah. made that very clear yeah. Yeah. but but yeah. but that is our income yeah okay. but that's, that's our income, income. Yeah. yeah our income is from taxes uh, from from indirect uh, and, investments. In, and, and also investment and also the petroleum petroleum uh, that's right we call like, it uh, income. revenue but that's the thing income. let's talk about that because it's uh. interesting because in my uh, you know uh, question guide here <laughs> you know the question here is mm-hmm. actually will this wow factor since we're talking about it mm-hmm. include tax incentives yeah 
<laughs> so let's talk about that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's uh, that's the well, in, interesting in, point that we're at. In incentive uh, at a corporate level or personal level? Well, that's the thing. Ah, there yeah. are two. There are two. There are two. Right. Because so, as a matter mm-hmm. of fact, mm-hmm. the Malaysian corporate tax is high. Yeah. And we are even okay. higher than Singapore. Mm-hmm. That makes business businesses business less friendly right. than Singapore. Mm-hmm. I I don't have to compare with other countries. I just mm-hmm. look at Singapore because they are our direct neighbor, right? Mm. And um, personal income tax is quite high as well. We don't have lots of deductions, the allowable deductions. Mm. So, um, as an individual, I would like to see more of that. Mm-hmm. But you see, it, like profs have said, yeah. the mm-hmm. direct revenue is from taxes. Yes. Mm-hmm. If companies are not making that much, mm-hmm. how to pay the tax? Where would the taxes mm-hmm. be coming from? Mm-hmm. There is actually an economic theory. So there is like we we'll call it. Uh, the impact of taxes towards the uh, the economy. Okay, there is one one we call it. Uh, if you refer to uh, if the modern economic theory is uh, Leffel curve. Okay, Leffel curve. But there is also a theory from the Ibn Khaldun. If you want to check, so basically it's saying that the lower the tax, okay, the better the economy. Okay, the lower the tax, the better the economy. That is actually the from the theory. But 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 th- there is actually like um, uh, we well, call it a debate, okay, between right. pro and cons. Whether right. you want to have, a, uh, whether you want to try, okay, experiment, okay, okay low low taxes, and then what will happen to our economy? Or you want to have a uh, high tax, okay, and then we will have sufficient right. money to spend for the uh, development and expenditure. Yes. Do we have a precedence for that? Do we have an example? Uh, did Malaysia ever go through a period of time that we were low in taxes in general, Prof? No. No. I wasn't born. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I don't believe so. So it's interesting to see whether yeah. you know, that would actually be something that can mm. work. Yeah. Yeah, that, that yeah, if yeah. that theory can hold water as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, a lot of has to do with where we are at the moment as well. I mean, wow. how have we done in 2021? Well, maybe mm. what Prof was saying, mm. that, let me backtrack a little, is mm. that if government charges less tax percentage, people have more disposable income. For sure. Therefore, there are more money mm. rolling in the rolling market. Rolling in the market. I think, I, think, I mean, that's mm. layman term. Yes. That's how yeah. we, we say it from an right. economic point of view. Yep. Yeah. But I, I also feel that um, any government should not interfere too much with business. I, I think that for... Mm-hmm. I, I believe that a freer market economy is very important. Mm. I, I mean, I'm not a very strong advocate for complete free economy, mm-hmm. but free market economy, because I don't mm-hmm. think that's um, possible or, um, I mean, not, not so possible in reality, but I think that uh, there should be less intervention in business mm. by the government. I, I, I feel that. Okay. I feel that, you know, the business people know exactly what to do. You really don't need to put up too much of, you know, um, restrictions, uh, policies to either dampen your growth or push you to grow because businesses are supposed to be organic. Mm-hmm. Uh, successful entrepreneurs who make lots of money, they know exactly what to do. They know how to run their corporations. Mm-hmm. So when government have less interest in running businesses, then it is also time mm-hmm. for the business community to thrive on their own. Right. And, and to be at their best. Uh, yeah, to be at their best yeah. because they, they don't have to worry. Like, let me just right. give, give you an example. Mm. I, I f- it's just from my observation. I feel that the Malaysian GLC have got too much interest in too many things. The GLCs. And, and that may not be uh, the best thing for private businesses. That, that's, mm. that's, that's just my observation. Interesting thoughts. And, and perhaps maybe where we can, in fact, uh, you know, balance things up in terms of taxation is to have more personal tax in- incentives, mm-hmm. right? Uh, more uh, tax deductions, like you were saying. Mm-hmm. Right, and maybe not ta- not tinker so much with corporate taxes at the moment. We, I, I don't think we, we can right. have higher corporate tax mm-hmm. because otherwise people will leave the country. Mm. On, only the half past, you know, the I wouldn't use the word half past six, but really just whoever who can do the smaller scale will stay, but the mega scale will find ways to leave the country or they will move their wealth away mm-hmm. from the country because mm-hmm. they're being taxed so much. Yeah. Then it becomes less efficient. Good point, yeah. And here's the thing, I mean, this, this uh, part of the... My, my question guideline here as well, right? It, it's something... Okay, I'm going to check with the two of you. I mean, how, how would you feel that our, comp- our country has fared so far, right? Now that we are approaching the endemic phase, and what are your, what are your thoughts on this? So this is like a center, center consolidation of our discussion today at the moment. And we'll see what happens uh, and when the Guzafro will be making his appearance. <laughs> okay, uh, um... I think uh, from from the historical part, okay, um, 
the economy has ups and downs okay ups and downs we have uh, the, I will call it the economy problem in 1970s 74 we have an, another economic problem in 1984 mm -hmm. and then 1998 that's right okay then 2001 and 2008 and also 12, 2021 okay or 2020 and 2021 so which is the we can say some economists say that it's the reset, okay, the reset button, okay. The economy goes up and then it's go down. Mm. So basically, if we have already uh, gone through the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and then it goes to endemic, right? So if we can actually manage that, okay, the the issue of COVID, okay, our economy will be going, uh, uh, will be increasing for the next uh, maybe eight to nine years. So it will be positively increasing. So and then we have another, another reset. Okay, we have another reset. So uh, any businesses or any what I call it uh, individual in Malaysia, if they understand that this cycle, okay, they will actually be prepared. Okay, be prepared for any uh, possible what I call it reset, economic reset such as COVID nineteen. Okay, so. For example, if they build, if they know this, okay, so uh, small businesses, uh, so they will start whenever the economy is good, they will have like saving, okay, for the rainy days, which is during the economic, which is not good. Right. Similarly, and uh, you can also take that to be striking while mm -hmm. things are down, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Which was pretty much this year, especially last year, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Right, so if you're not started already, this is a little bit on a side note. You well, know, you, see, you might be a little bit late to the game. You la. see, what mm. professor have said mm. is is correct. Economic cycles go up and down. Everything that's come down will mm. go up. Mm. That's theory, right? Okay. But when you are in the business, when you are thriving, you wouldn't think that you are at your peak. Mm. You wouldn't think of saving. You would think about more development, growing, and spending, right? right you like keep spending. Expansion, expansion. Yeah. yeah, and then you may be gearing a lot more because mm -hmm. you think that mm. you know. You of course everybody would think that their business will do better next year, and mm. you know the next is going to be mm. better. Yeah. Then suddenly there is a dip. Yeah, but that's can, but that's just greed, though. It's mm. not exactly greed. That's, mm. that's just business strategies as well. Yeah, because but when you are kay. riding high, mm. you want to do more. You want to develop. So when you want to develop, you need to spend to develop. You need to make investments. Mm -hmm. So money, money goes out. Mm. Then suddenly there's a dip. Then you fall. So when you are in business during this pandemic. Most people will not look at this as an economy reset or a business cycle or economic cycle. All they are concerned, concerning is, am I going to climb up? Am I going to survive? Am I going to get out of it? Right? So I think, uh, yes, what Professor says is correct, it's, but it's really theoretical. But, but for businesses on the ground, when mm. you are in the position of business, you don't think like that. Yeah, you, no you, cycle. Yeah, yeah. But, but basically, if you look at how uh, the buffet, Warren Buffet, uh, thinking, right? So they are also doing business, right? So they are waiting for the time to for the economy reset for them to invest more. Yeah, but that that's mega scale. Uh, yeah. And let, let's talk about the warung. Yeah, a, yeah, that's why. That's <laughs> let's why. talk about the retail need, store in KLCC. People, we need more people to be what we call it to be to understand about the economy, about the ups and downs. So whether you okay. have to actually save. You have to save for yeah. your for, for your rainy days. You have you to know. make provisions all yeah, the time, provision. right? Yeah. right? Interesting yeah. thoughts here. Right? Just mm -hmm. uh, putting a full stop to that, um, and then moving on to the next part of the discussion. As we uh, are waiting for the official start in Parliament, um, performance-wise, any thoughts on this? I mean, we've heard uh, opinions. You know, that we look at uh, overall growth will be a few percent, like three percent, maybe overall across twenty twenty one. The pessimistic side even has pegged it to zero. 0% growth overall for Malaysia across the entire 2021. Any thoughts on how we would be faring? Okay, basically, <laughs> if you look at the, uh, our performance, we are doing okay before the pandemic. So we are doing about 4 to 5% uh, on average. Until the year 2020, uh, we plunged down. That's right. right. So we have a negative 5.7, and then it, our average turns out to be 2.7 if I'm not mistaken but before that it was always 4 to 5 percent mm -hmm. okay it was always to 4 to 5 percent every year consistently okay in some certain time we have also uh, achieved 8 percent right 8 percent but this is the thing okay when we have this economy reset we, we, we will have like a, a slowdown in the market so basically 
the the economy is actually trying to adjust again because you are you are, you already move so high okay you are climbing so high and then um, there is like must be like a uh, to, to to slow you down okay to slow you down so that you can actually have a fresh start okay you have a fresh start before the the for so in looking forward i believe that our economy will be uh, growing at also at 4 to 5% per annum mm. right? for so 2022 For 2022 onwards, so it okay. will be around that. Okay, so about four to four uh, to five percent per annum. But for 2022, we will see. Okay, we will see for the the how actually we actually manage to maneuver. Okay, all the uh, issues or problems of uh, uh, businesses, unemployment, and so on. So if we can do that, can probably will be four to point five percent as previously. Because in 1998, we plunged more. Uh, I mean, bigger than in 2020. Like the COVID effects, ah, yeah. right? It's bigger. Yeah, it's about 9.7 percent, if not mistaken. Okay. The, the 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 contraction. Right. But we managed to get it to four to five percent afterwards. Mm-hmm. Right. First, it's a matter of uh, uh, how long that would take. Yeah? yeah. Any any thoughts in terms of performance for the rest of 2021 projections for 2022, Yinsen? I would be harder on ourselves. I I would say that, assuming that. Prior to year 2020, um, uh, before 2020, if we were growing at, let's say, 4% to 5%, and then we plunged so badly because of the pandemic mm-hmm. to zero, let's say just zero, then when we recover, I wouldn't call a zero to four a growth. I would say go, going back to pre-pandemic, but I would personally look at what is beyond to let's say the four and a half percent, then I call it the growth. Mm. Because that is like from 4.5, I dropped to zero because of pandemic. That's not normal. But I would expect the economy to go back to 4.0 and then look at the beyond. Mm. But but then my my own um, observation or uh, something that I cannot, I haven't got, I haven't got an answer. Percent, yeah, I haven't right. quantified is, mm-hmm. What's going to be our growth factor? Mm. Well, what do you think? What's, okay. what's going the, the, to the growth factor that yeah. will be okay? Will be the technology factor. So it might be, it might be having a booster then. Okay, it might be having a booster. For example, okay, uh, previously we have a four about four to five percent. Now after we have already digitalized, we have like so. For example, your company, right? You have digital. You can. You don't have to go, and uh, which means that you are making more money. More yeah, on the practical scale, though, we're talking yeah. about twenty twenty two. So we still have to put that into perspective, right? Okay. So I, I, on some things, as long as internet connectivity is there, mm-hmm. uh, we can safely say for urban centers in Malaysia, mm-hmm. some of the semi-urban areas. Unfortunately, not yet. Those really are out of reach, uh, rural areas, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, internet connectivity is mm-hmm. something that we can rely on. Technology is fast. Mm-hmm. There are apps created every single day by so many different people for so many different purposes. But then, of course, practically speaking, there's that skill, right? The skill gap amongst people who know how to really maneuver through cyberspace or or be able to be the best uh, entrepreneurs that they can be, right? So that, that will take some time and training. Yeah, yeah probably. Uh, it's also yeah. initiative. It's also mm-hmm. how prepared the person is, how much initiative they take towards upskilling from that particular mm-hmm. endeavor, isn't it? it, mm-hmm. it so it's not, like, it's not really like you can just switch that on button and say like, everybody's now going to be online and mm-hmm. thriving online successfully, businesses included. But, but, but I've, uh, I'm, uh, I'm actually, I'm doing a survey for a KPK. So I'm looking at the... Um, We call it the uh, spending behavior, okay, of Malaysian people and also financial vulnerability. We are shopping queen online, right? <laughs> we are. We are the shopping okay. king and queens online. Yeah. Malaysia. So, yeah. so yeah. what? What? Or okay. Southeast Asia, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. The data is that showing that during okay, uh, before and also during pandemic, so we have a, say, a significant increase for online shopping, for shopping online. So that is from data. So normally I only always uh, say when I you look at the data and the the data is statistically. Significant, right? However, Prof. Yeah. However, mm-hmm. after the MC, okay. So, so I know of a few businesses, mm-hmm. um, who mushroom during the MCO mm-hmm. period. They make up to like a few couple, uh, a couple of hundred thousand in mm-hmm. sales per month during mm-hmm. the first month of the mm-hmm. starting uh, of the mm-hmm. of the, of them in operation. Mm-hmm. But now that the market have reopened, mm-hmm. they saw a 90 degree dip 
in mm. their business and mm-hmm. suddenly they become not relevant anymore yeah mm. that, so, that's what i saw i know yeah we have to be able to separate between what what is an attempt and what yeah. is a, uh, a, sustainable, a, su- a sustainable, uh, sustainable sustainable success yeah. exactly yeah. and yeah. the other yeah. thought that we talked about shopping as well is that uh well now we also need to focus if we can individually how to keep our shopping to the vendors <laughs> and so on which are malaysian Mm. Right or Malaysian register. Try to keep that's that money. something very difficult. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. That will be really tough. Okay. So now uh, the time is here. We're going to cross oh, over sorry. to Parliament, of course, where our finance minister will okay. uh, is currently uh, starting his budget 2022 oh. tabling. Right. So stay tuned right here on Tracks FM as well as across the board on uh, our Facebook page, Tracks FM official as well. <laughs> Syukur Alhamdulillah atas nikmat Allah yang terbentang luas sepemandangan seraya kami bertawakal dan besar bagi menggunakan sejumlah wang yang daripada kumpulan wang disatukan selawat dan salam perkhidmatan bagi tahun 2022 dan bagi memperuntukkan jumlah wang itu untuk perkhidmatan bagi tahun itu dibaca bagi, bagi kali kedua sekarang silakan Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Syukur Alhamdulillah Atas nikmat Allah yang terbentang luas Sepemandangan Seraya kami bertawakal dan berserah Pada setiap daya yang diikhtiarkan Selawat dan salam Buat junjungan besar Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu alaihi wasallam Bahawa baginda lah suri teladan Buat umat manusia zaman berzaman Datuk yang dipertua, ahli-ahli yang berhormat, serta saudara dan saudari sekeluruh keluarga Malaysia yang dikasihi. Amatlah besar harapan rakyat menjelang pembentangan bajet 2022 yang syarat disasari dengan usaha kita semua sebagai sebuah keluarga Malaysia untuk bangkit semula memulih negara. Maka untuk perbentangan kali ini, insya Allah. Kita harapkan ada perkabaran-perkabaran baik. Moga bajet 2022 menjadi suar harapan. Terang menyinar di hujung kemulut pandemik agar rakyat kembali makmur dalam norma baru. Datuk Yang Dipertua, dalam mengharung pandemik global ini, negara-negara sedunia terpaksa mengurus dua beban duka. Menyelamat nyawa sejagat dan mempertahan iktisad. Bagi Malaysia, ternyata tahun ini adalah men- lebih mencabar buat kita. 2021 yang pada awalnya kita jangka sebagai sebuah tahun pemulihan, balangnya telah tertangguh. Dek situasi penularan COVID-19 yang terus kritikal sejak pembentangan belanjawan 2021 setahun lalu. Di luar rencana, COVID-19 bermutasi dan mengganas. Negara kita tidak terkecuali dengan tempias gelombang ketiga sehingga mengakibatkan kes harian pernah mencecah lebih 24,000. Kini jumlah kes direkodkan sudah menjangkau 2.4 juta dan lebih 28,000 orang ahli keluarga Malaysia telah terkorban. Takziah diucapkan kepada ahli keluarga kita yang telah kehilangan orang tersayang akibat virus ini. Buat kesekian kalinya, Negara terpaksa mengharungi episod Perintah Kawalan Pergerakan yang panjang. Sementara kita laksanakan pelan pemulihan negara yang turut didokong program imunisasi COVID-19 kebangsaan sebagai langkah keluar daripada pandemik durjana ini. Alhamdulillah, kita kini berjaya mencapai 95% penduduk dewasa dan 62% remaja yang telah divaksinasi sepenuhnya. Pencapaian ini merupakan antara yang terbaik di dunia. Hasilnya, bilangan kes COVID-19 telah menurun. Sementara penggunaan wad ICU bagi kes COVID-19 berada pada tahap 42%. Oleh itu, sistem kesihatan awam kita ini tidak lagi terbeban. Dalam soal memelihara rakyat dan perniagaan, kita tidak pernah alpa. Walau digasak pelbagai cabaran dalam ruang fiskal yang terhad, kerajaan tetap mencari jalan menyediakan bantuan kepada yang memerlukan. Bukanlah perkara yang mudah, tetapi Alhamdulillah, sebanyak 8 pakej bantuan dan rangsangan ekonomi telah disediakan kerajaan 
dengan jumlah keseluruhan 530 bilion ringgit yang tidak termasuk peruntukan belanjawan 2021. Pakej-pakej inilah yang telah memastikan kita ada makanan dihidangkan, ada didikan buat anak watan, ada perniagaan yang dipertahan, ada pekerjaan yang diciptakan dan pastinya masih ada lagi sebuah kehidupan. Melaluinya juga pertumbuhan ekonomi yang sebelum ini menguncup 5.600 pada tahun 2020 kini telah berkembang 7.1% setakat separuh pertama 2021. Walaupun suku ketiga tahun ini dijangka terkesan ekoran PKP ketiga, namun suku keempat dijangka akan memulih apabila hampir semua negeri beralih ke fasa empat serta ekonomi dan sosial dibenarkan beroperasi dengan kapasiti penuh. Keseluruhannya, pertumbuhan ekonomi kita dijangka berkembang antara 3 hingga 4 peratus bagi tahun ini, insyaAllah. Pada tahun hadapan, ekonomi negara diunjur terus berkembang antara 5.5 hingga 6.5 peratus berpaksikan asas ekonomi yang masih kukuh dan strukturnya yang pelbagai. Namun, prestasi ini turut bergantung kepada faktor-faktor lain, antaranya kejayaan mengawal pandemik, keberkesanan pelaksanaan, pelaksanaan program vaksinasi serta ketuguhan prospek ekonomi dan perdagangan dunia. Datuk Yang Dipertua, seperti tahun lalu, bajet 2022 dirangka dengan mengekalkan tradisi keterbukaan tim MOF. Bajet ini terhasil dari susun dari siri turun padang dan jelajah negeri. Perbincangan dengan lebih 30 sesi kumpulan fokus selain mengkaji lebih 1,100 memorandum dan hampir 50,000 cadangan yang diterima melalui portal bajet 2022. Lebih bermakna, bajet 2022 dirangka setelah 80 sesi sumbang saran bersama-sama ahli yang berhormat merentasi doktrin politik tak kira kerajaan mahupun pembangkang. Kita semua telah bermesyuarah, bertukar-tukar pandangan dan sama-sama memikir kemaslahatan negara. Tidak cukup dengan itu, bagi meningkatkan ketelusan penyediaan bajet tahunan, buat julung-julung kalinya, tim MOF telah menerbitkan kenyataan pra-bajet 2022 dan empat kertas konsultasi awam berangkumi topik berkenaan penambah baikan perolehan kerajaan, pemberian bantuan tunai, insentif cukai dan tanggungjawab fiskal. Saya rakamkan jutaan penghargaan kepada semua pihak yang meluangkan masa dan mengemukakan idea serta pandangan. Pada kami di MOF, inilah bukti kebersamaan kita dalam mengharungi hari-hari mendatang sebagai sebuah keluarga. Tahun hadapan, tumpuan kita semestinya adalah untuk memulih semula setiap segmen sosioekonomi negara. Usaha untuk membina daya tahan turut digerakkan bagi mengukuhkan keupayaan perniagaan dan sistem kesihatan dalam mendepani cabaran mendatang. Akhirnya, melangkah ke hadapan instrumen pembaharuan akan mula dilaksana supaya seiring dengan landscape dunia teknologi tanpa sempadan serta agenda kelestarian. Atas iltizam tersebut, bajet tahun 2022 akan bertemakan Keluarga Malaysia Makmur Sejahtera. Bajet kali ini mendukung tiga paksi utama iaitu memperkukuh pemulihan, membina daya tahan dan memacu pembaharuan. Matlamat, matlamat bajet 2022 kekal dengan tiga fokus induk iaitu pertama, rakyat yang sejahtera, kedua, perniagaan yang berdaya tahan dan ketiga, ekonomi yang makmur dan mampan. Bajet 2022 yang dijajarkan kepada rancangan Malaysia ke-12 telah diadun sebagai kesinambungan daripada pakej bantuan dan rangsangan ekonomi sebelum ini. Juga ditambah baik dan dilengkapi usaha baru untuk membentuk sebuah bajet yang inklusif, mampan dan seimbang. Mengambil kira aspirasi, impian dan keperluan ahli keluarga Malaysia, di samping jangkaan peningkatan hasil kerajaan bagi tahun 2022 kepada 234 bilion ringgit, Kerajaan akan, akan terus menyediakan bajet yang mengembang. Bajet 2022 akan menyediakan sejumlah 332.1 bilion ringgit yang menyaksikan nilai peruntukan tertinggi 
berbanding bajet-bajet sebelum ini. Daripada jumlah tersebut, kerajaan bercadang untuk menyediakan 233.5 bilion ringgit bagi belanja mengurus, 75.6 bilion ringgit untuk belanja pembangunan dan 23 bilion ringgit di bawah kumpulan wang Covid-19. Sejumlah 2 bilion ringgit turut disediakan sebagai simpanan luar jangka. Sungguh pun ini merupakan bajet mengembang defisit fiskal 2022 diunjur berkurang kepada 6% daripada KDNK berbanding 6.5% pada tahun 2021. Datuk yang dipertua, fokus pertama bajet. Rakyat yang sejahtera. Bagi mendapkap erat makna sejahtera, iltizam keluarga Malaysia atas ilham yang amat berhormat Perdana Menteri memasang impian agar setiap daripada kita tersemai nilai keterangkuman, kebersamaan dan kesyukuran. Strategi pertama di bawah fokus ini ialah memulih kehidupan dan mata pencarian. Tumpuan kerajaan di bawah strategi ini adalah untuk meneruskan pemberian bantuan tunai langsung secara bersasar, memperkasa aspek pendidikan dan kesihatan awam serta terus menjana peluang-peluang pekerjaan. Pada tahun hadapan, inisiatif bantuan tunai langsung akan ditambah baik. Kerajaan akan memperkenalkan Bantuan Keluarga Malaysia atau BKM dengan beberapa pembaharuan supaya kumpulan yang benar-benar terkesan diberi lebih tumpuan. Pembaharuan ini telah mengambil kira cadangan yang diterima dari orang ramai melalui penerbitan kertas konsultasi awam berhubung penambahbaikan bantu rakyat. Oleh itu, untuk tahun 2022, BKM akan menyalurkan bantuan iaitu sebanyak RM2,000 kepada isi rumah yang mempunyai tiga orang anak atau lebih dengan pendapatan kurang RM2,500 sebulan. Pemberian bantuan ini merupakan peningkatan berbanding RM1,800 iaitu kadar tertinggi di bawah Bantuan Perhatian Rakyat atau BPR sebelum ini. Selanjutnya, maklum balas lain yang diterima turut menyentuh soal cabaran yang perlu ditanggung oleh ibu tunggal dalam menyara anak-anaknya selain warga emas B40 yang kekurangan simpanan persaraan dan tiada sumber pendapatan tetap. Sebagai pembaharuan untuk tahun hadapan, kerajaan juga akan memberi bantuan tambahan sebanyak RM500 lagi kepada ibu atau bapa tunggal yang mempunyai anak tanggungan dan berpendapatan bulanan sehingga RM5,000. Selain itu, bantuan tambahan sebanyak RM300 lagi turut diberikan kepada isi rumah warga emas. Ini bermakna kepada ibu atau bapa tunggal dengan tiga anak atau lebih layak mendapat BKM maksimum sebanyak RM2,500. Secara keseluruhan, BKM akan memanfaatkan lebih 9.6 juta penerima dengan peruntukan 8.2 bilion ringgit iaitu peningkatan berbanding berbanding dengan 8.6 juta penerima dengan peruntukan 7 bilion ringgit di bawah BPR. Selanjutnya berhubung bantuan yang disalurkan oleh Jabatan Kebajikan Masyarakat. Syarat kelayakan kebajikan akan dinaikkan kepada paras garis kemiskinan makanan 2019 iaitu RM1,169 berbanding PJK 2016 iaitu RM980 sebelum ini. Usaha meluaskan liputan perlindungan sosial ini adalah selaras dengan komitmen kerajaan untuk memastikan bantuan yang sampai ke tangan mereka yang memerlukan turut mengambil kira kenaikan kos sara hidup semasa. Oleh itu, dengan kenaikan ini, lebih ramai akan menikmati faedah bantuan kebajikan di bawah JKM dengan peruntukan tambahan 200 juta ringgit. Secara keseluruhan, 2.4 bilion ringgit disediakan bagi penyaluran bantuan kebajikan untuk manfaat lebih 440 ribu isi rumah memerlukan. Datuk yang dipertua mengambil ibrah firman Allah Subhanahu wa taala dalam surah Al-Baqarah ayat 20, 220. Kita diingatkan akan perlunya menjaga kesejahteraan anak-anak yatim. Sejak wabak COVID-19 menjengah ke tanah kita, lebih 4,700 anak-anak telah hilang tempat bermanja apabila ibu bapa mereka pergi buat selamanya akibat virus ini. Sebagai keluarga Malaysia, menjadi tanggungjawab kita untuk memastikan masa depan anak-anak ini terus terjaga. Pada tahun hadapan, 
kerajaan menyediakan 25 juta ringgit kepada Yayasan Keluarga Malaysia bagi memimpin usaha melindungi kebajikan pendidikan dan masa depan anak-anak ini. Sebagai tambahan, kerajaan juga menyeru semua pihak khususnya sektor korporat untuk sama menyumbang demi kebajikan anak-anak ini. Yang amat berhormat Perdana Menteri telah berkesempatan melawat anak-anak yang kehilangan ibu dan bapa akibat COVID-19 pada 16 Oktober lalu. Seluruh negara turut melahirkan rasa simpati atas nasib adik-adik adik beradik ini. Buat adik Muhammad Hadrami, Husna Humairah, Muhammad Haras, Muhammad Hawas dan Hainah Humarah serta anak-anak yatim piatu keluarga Malaysia yang lain. Kami sayang semua. Kami sentiasa ada untuk menjaga kamu semua. Kerajaan menggesa semua pihak tidak kira NGO, komuniti setempat, pemimpin tempatan, malah syarikat korporat untuk memainkan peranan bagi memastikan kebajikan anak-anak ini terus terpelihara supaya semua dapat hidup bersama sebagai satu keluarga tanpa terpisah dan dapat membina masa hadapan yang cerah. Datuk Yang Dipertua, kerajaan akan terus mengutamakan aspek kesihatan awam bagi membina daya tahan negara dalam persediaan kita ke fasa endemik COVID-19. Bajet 2022 menyediakan 32.4 bilion ringgit kepada Kementerian Kesihatan untuk perbelanjaan mengurus dan pembangunan. Sebagai kerajaan yang mementingkan kesejahteraan rakyatnya, peruntukan bagi Kementerian Kesihatan adalah yang kedua terbesar selepas Kementerian Pendidikan. Peperangan kita dengan pandemik COVID-19 ini masih belum berakhir. Oleh itu, tambahan RM4 bilion ringgit disediakan khusus untuk meneruskan agenda menangani COVID-19 yang merangkumi RM2 bilion ringgit bagi membiayai program vaksinasi. Manakala RM2 bilion ringgit lagi disediakan bagi meningkatkan kapasiti fasiliti perkhidmatan kesihatan awam seperti pembelian bekalan ubat, bahan guna habis, PPE dan, dan kit kesihatan. Dalam semangat keluarga Malaysia, Kementerian Kesihatan juga telah menyumber luar ke hospital swasta dan hospital seliaan kementerian lain bagi mengoptimumkan kapasiti kesihatan dalam negara. Selanjutnya, bagi terus menang dalam melawan COVID-19, kerajaan bercadang untuk melaksanakan perolehan ubat antiviral yang didapati berkesan terhadap pelbagai virus termasuk COVID-19. Yang utama sekali, program imunisasi COVID-19 kebangsaan akan terus diperkasa bagi membekalkan dos ketiga sebagai vaksin penggalak kepada semua orang dewasa di samping meneruskan vaksinasi kepada anak-anak berusia 12 hingga 17 tahun. Kerajaan telah menandatangani perjanjian untuk mendapatkan 88 juta dos iaitu bersamaan lebih 140% penduduk dan cukup untuk memberi dos ketiga kepada semua penduduk berusia 12 tahun dan ke atas. Pada kesempatan ini saya merakamkan penghargaan kepada semua ahli yang berhormat yang sebulat suara meluluskan pindaan akta untuk membenarkan kegunaan dana kumpulan wang amanah negara bagi membiayai perolehan vaksin COVID-19. Dengan pindaan ini, kerajaan akan membelanjakan sebaiknya bagi memenuhi keperluan vaksinasi dalam memulih semula dan membina daya tahan buat rakyat dan perniagaan. Bagi tahun hadapan, kerajaan bercadang untuk memberikan pelepasan cukai individu dan potongan cukai kepada majikan ke atas kos berkaitan pengambilan vaksin penggalak yang dibiayai sendiri. Datuk Yang Dipertua, aspek kesihatan awam juga akan diberi perhatian dalam memupuk budaya sihat serta menangani masalah penyakit tidak berjangkit seperti kencing manis, darah tinggi dan obesiti, kerajaan bersetuju untuk meneruskan agenda nasional Malaysia Sihat. Dalam sesi sembang santai bersama anak muda, Dr. Shantesh Kumar telah membangkit isu berkenaan penyakit jarang jumpa. Oleh itu, kerajaan akan memantapkan pengurusan klinikal penyakit jarang jumpa di Malaysia seperti lisosomal. Selain itu, ke arah gaya hidup sihat juga, kerajaan bercadang untuk meluaskan kenaan duty excise ke atas produk-produk minuman bergula dalam bentuk pracampuran berasaskan coklat atau koko, malt, kopi dan teh. Kerajaan juga bercadang mengenakan duty excise ke atas produk cecair atau gel mengandungi nikotin 
yang digunakan untuk rokok elektronik dan vape. Bagi memastikan kesiapsiagaan perkhidmatan kesihatan awam, kerajaan akan bekerjasama dengan Persatuan Bulan Sabit Merah dan St. John Ambulance untuk meningkatkan akses dan capaian respons perkhidmatan ambulans. Kerajaan telah bersetuju untuk menyambung pelantikan secara kontrak lebih 10,000 pegawai perubatan, pergigian dan farmasi selama tempoh khidmat wajib selama 2 tahun kepada maksimum 4 tahun bagi memastikan kesinambungan perkhidmatan dan sebagai persediaan pengajian kebakaran mereka. Sebagai tambahan, sukacita diumumkan kerajaan bersetuju meluluskan penajaan program kebakaran dengan peruntukan 100 juta ringgit untuk manfaat 3,000 pegawai kontrak perubatan dan pergigian. Krisis pandemik ini telah menerokkan masalah kesepitan hidup, keganasan rumah tangga dan kemurungan sehingga menjadi punca kepada isu kesihatan mental. Maka, bajet ini memperuntukkan 70 juta ringgit bagi terus memastikan isu kesihatan mental ini diberi keutamaan. Antaranya untuk memperkukuh perkhidmatan sokongan, kaunseling dan psikososial, menambah program advokasi serta memperkasa peranan NGO sebagai penggerak program kesihatan mental. Selanjutnya, kerajaan juga bercadang untuk meluaskan skop pelepasan cukai pendapatan individu bagi perbelanjaan pemeriksaan kesihatan meliputi kos perkhidmat konsultasi pakar psikiatri, ahli psikologi klinikal dan kaunselor yang berdaftar. Datuk Yang Beri Pertua, bajet ini kekal mengutamakan pendidikan sebagai segmen terpenting perbelanjaan negara. Kementerian Pendidikan Malaysia akan terus menerima peruntukan terbesar iaitu sejumlah RM52.6 bilion atau 16% daripada keseluruhan anggaran perbelanjaan persekutuan. Sementara itu, Kementerian Pengajian Tinggi bakal diperuntukkan sejumlah RM14.5 bilion. Ringgit. Tidak ada yang lebih menggembirakan buat anak-anak apabila dapat kembali semula ke sekolah secara bersemuka bersama rakan. Setiap awal tahun, tentunya ibu bapa yang paling sibuk menyediakan kelengkapan sekolah anak-anak. Bagi tahun 2022, kerajaan bersetuju untuk menyediakan bantuan awal persekolahan sebanyak RM150 iaitu meningkat berbanding RM100 sebelum ini. Sejumlah 450 juta ringgit diperuntukkan yang dijangka memanfaatkan 3 juta murid-murid yang layak. Dengan sekolah mula dibuka, suasana pembelajaran yang kondusif buat anak-anak akan terus diberi perhatian. Pada tahun hadapan, sejumlah 1 bilion ringgit disediakan untuk kerja-kerja penyelenggaraan dan pembaikan sekolah. Peruntukan ini termasuk 140 juta ringgit kepada Jakim bagi menyelenggara antaranya sekolah tafis, sekolah agama rakyat dan institusi pondok berdaftar iaitu meningkat berbanding berbanding 100 juta ringgit pada tahun 2021. Peruntukan penyelenggaraan kepada lebih 10000 sekolah di bawah Kementerian Pendidikan akan diagihkan mengikut jenis sekolah berdasarkan kadar yang seragam. Bagi tahun 2022, sebanyak 120 juta ringgit disediakan untuk manfaat 1800 buah sekolah jenis kebangsaan Cina dan juga sekolah jenis kebangsaan Tamil. Di samping itu, pada tahun hadapan juga kerajaan akan terus menaik taraf sekolah-sekolah daif dengan peruntukan dinaikkan kepada 746 juta ringgit. Sebilangan besar peruntukan ini adalah untuk menaik taraf sekolah daif dengan 112 projek di Sabah dan 165 projek di Sarawak. Bagi memperkasa agenda pendidikan khas, kerajaan menyediakan 50 juta ringgit antaranya untuk membiayai pembelian peralatan mengajar dan menambah baik fasiliti sekolah berkeperluan khas. Selain itu, sebanyak 8 buah blok baru pendidikan khas turut dibina antaranya di SMK Tuanku Lailatul Syarin di Perlis dan SMK Agama Alu Gajah di Melaka. Bagi memastikan murid-murid daripada keluarga berpendapatan rendah mendapat kandungan khasiat harian demi pertumbuhan fizikal dan mental yang menyeluruh, kerajaan akan meneruskan penyediaan bekalan susu harian di bawah rancangan makanan tambahan dengan peruntukan 400 juta ringgit. Sebahagian perolehan ini akan dikhaskan kepada pengeluar susu tempatan. Sewaktu pelaksanaan PDPR, para guru memainkan peranan mereka dalam memastikan setiap anak murid tidak tercicir daripada mendapat pendidikan formal. Sebagai menghargai jasa guru 
yang menyediakan bahan mengajar tambahan kepada murid-murid semasa tempo pandemik. Bajet ini buat pertama kalinya menyediakan insentif khas alat bantuan mengajar secara sekali bayar sebanyak RM100 kepada lebih 400,000 guru sekolah di bawah KPM. Datuk Yang Dipertua, sepanjang tempoh pandemik, mahasiswa tetap meneruskan pengajian mereka dalam norma yang baru. Bagi pelajar yang kurang mampu, mereka ada kalanya perlu meminjam peranti kawan atau terpaksa ke pusat internet di Pekan untuk membuat tugasan pengajian. Malah, kadang-kadang ada juga antara mereka yang tidak dapat hadir ke kuliah online. Bagi memastikan proses pengajian para pelajar B40 terus terpelihara, kerajaan dengan kerjasama syarikat telekomunikasi terpilih akan melaksanakan inisiatif peranti siswa keluarga Malaysia bagi membekalkan sebuah tablet kepada setiap pelajar B40 di institusi pengajian tinggi. Bagi tujuan ini, kerajaan akan menyediakan peruntukan 450 juta ringgit di samping komitmen syarikat telekomunikasi yang turut menyumbang kira-kira 65 juta ringgit. Insya-Allah seramai 600,000 siswa-siswi daripada keluarga B40 bakal menerima manfaat daripada inisiatif ini. Sebagai tambahan, kerajaan bercadang untuk melanjutkan pelepasan khas cukai pendapatan individu sehingga RM2,500 ke atas pembelian telefon bimbit, komputer dan tablet sehingga 31 Disember 2022. Seperti semua maklum, PTPTN ditubuhkan bagi mengurus pinjaman pendidikan yang disediakan sebagai kemudahan kepada pelajar institusi pengajian tinggi tempatan. Sebagai pinjaman, semestinya ia satu amanah yang wajib dibayar semula oleh peminjam. Jika tidak, ia menafikan peluang anak-anak kita pada masa hadapan. Oleh itu, bagi memudahkan proses bayaran balik dan mengupuk sikap bertanggungjawab, kerajaan bersetuju memberikan diskaun bayaran balik pinjaman PTPTN bermula 1 November 2021 hingalah 30 April 2022 seperti berikut. Pertama, diskaun 15% atas baki hutang untuk penyelesaian penuh pinjaman. Kedua, diskaun 12% untuk bayaran sekurang-kurangnya 50% daripada baki hutang dalam sekali bayaran dan ketiga, diskaun 10% untuk bayaran balik melalui potongan gaji atau debit terus mengikut jadual. Daripada dalam RMK12, kerajaan telah mengenal pasti pendidikan dan latihan teknikal dan vocational ataupun TVEC sebagai salah satu pemacu perubahan bagi memenuhi permintaan pekerja oleh industri kita dengan lebih baik. Bagi memperkasa bidang TVEC, kerajaan menyediakan RM6.6 bilion untuk melaksanakan pelbagai inisiatif di bawah kementerian dan agensi-agensi berkaitan. Tumpuan diberikan kepada usaha memenuhi keperluan industri semasa. Sehubungan itu, pertukan tambahan 200 juta ringgit disediakan untuk program usaha sama dengan industri termasuk skim latihan dua, dual nasional dan program persijilan industri. Datuk Yang Dipertua, seperti semua sedia maklum, pandemi COVID-19 telah memberi kesan yang signifikan kepada pekerjaan dan mata pencarian rakyat. Dengan kadar pengangguran telah meningkat sehingga 5.3% pada Mei 2020, sungguh pun ia kini telah menyederhana dengan kadar 4.6% pada Ogos 2021, hampir 750,000 saudara-saudari kita yang masih menganggu, peng, menganggur perlu dibantu. Oleh itu, mengambil semangat konsep Job Guarantee. Bagi tahun hadapan, kerajaan dibawa inisiatif Jamin Kerja Keluarga Malaysia atau Jamin Kerja akan menjamin Penyediaan 600,000 peluang pekerjaan dengan peruntukan berjumlah 4.8 bilion ringgit. Kerajaan melalui Perkeso akan meneruskan usaha pengambilan pekerja, bekerja melalui inisiatif insentif pengajian jamin kerja, penggajian jamin kerja dengan sasaran 300,000 orang dan peruntukan 2 bilion ringgit. Di bawah inisiatif ini, kepada majikan yang mengambil keluarga Malaysia yang tidak aktif bekerja, kerajaan akan memberikan insentif sebanyak 20% daripada gaji bulanan bagi tempoh 6 bulan pertama dan 30% bagi 6 bulan berikutnya tertakluk kepada pekerjaan bergaji RM1,500 ke atas. Selain itu, bagi menggalakkan majikan menyediakan peluang pekerjaan kepada kumpulan tumpuan seperti OKU, orang asli dan banduan pula, 
Kerajaan akan memberikan insentif sebanyak 30% daripada gaji bulanan bagi tempoh 6 bulan pertama dan 40% bagi 6 bulan berikutnya tertakluk kepada pekerjaan bergaji RM1,200 ke atas. Bagi menggalakkan wanita kembali bekerja, insentif ini turut dipanjangkan kepada majikan yang menggaji golongan wanita tidak bekerja berlebihi 365 hari, ibu tunggal dan juga suri rumah. Selanjutnya, Inisiatif Malaysia Short Term Employment Program atau MyStep akan diteruskan dengan menawarkan 80,000 peluang pekerjaan secara kontrak merangkumi 50,000 pekerjaan dalam sektor awam dan 30,000 pekerjaan dalam syarikat berkaitan kerajaan mulai Januari 2022. Bajet ini turut menyasarkan 220,000 pelatih untuk menjalani pelbagai program latihan dan peningkatan kemahiran dengan peruntukan keseluruhan 1.1 bilion ringgit. Antara inisiatif yang akan dilaksanakan termasuklah program Place and Train iaitu latihan dengan jaminan pekerjaan. Program peningkatan kemahiran dan kerjasama industri turut dipergiat dengan keutamaan kepada kemahiran digital seperti contoh program Global Online Workforce atau GLO di bawah MDEC. Contohnya, Puan Zeti Haiza, pengurus di sebuah agensi pelancongan di Melaka. Tanpa pelancong dari luar negara, pendapatannya terjejas. Melalui program latihan GLO oleh MDEC, Puan Zeti menceburkan diri secara freelancing di platform dalam talian untuk menjana pendapatan dari rumah sekaligus boleh menawarkan perkhidmatannya ke luar negara. Berdasarkan keberhasilan pelaksanaan program latihan dan peningkatan kemahiran di bawah Belanjawan 2021, lebih 85% daripada pelatih telah ditawarkan peluang penempatan pekerjaan. Diharapkan melalui pelaksanaan inisiatif Jamin Kerja, serta langkah pemulihan ekonomi dapat menurunkan kadar pengangguran negara kepada 4% dan mencapai tahap guna tenaga penuh. Sebagai usaha menggalakkan keluarga Malaysia mengikuti program latihan serta mencuburi bidang baru, pelepasan cukai bagi perbelanjaan menghadiri kursus peningkatan kemahiran atau kemajuan diri dinaikkan daripada RM1,000 kepada RM2,000 sehingga 2023. Selain itu, kepada yang mengambil kursus dengan badan-badan profesional yang diluluskan, mereka layak mendapat pelepasan cukai ke atas yuran sehingga RM7,000. Kursus profesional yang diluluskan antaranya merangkumi bidang perakaunan, kewangan serta yang berkaitan alam sekitar, sosial dan tabib urus atau ESG. Kerajaan juga bercadang melanjutkan potongan cukai dua kali kepada syarikat yang memberi biasiswa kepada pelajar institusi pengajian tinggi dan diperluas kepada semua bidang pengajian. Datuk yang dipertua, Krisis pandemik ini telah membuktikan bahawa sistem perlindungan sosial perlu diperkukuh dan diberi keutamaan buat semua. Maka kerajaan ini komited untuk meneruskan pelbagai dasar dan program perlindungan bagi manfaat keluarga Malaysia yang memerlukan. Di bawah program voucher perlindungan tenang, penerima bantuan B40 layak menerima voucher RM50 sebagai bantuan kewangan untuk membeli produk perlindungan tenang termasuk takaful hayat dan kemalangan diri. Untuk tahun hadapan, inisiatif ini akan diteruskan dengan nilai voucher ditingkatkan kepada RM75. Sebagai tambahan, voucher ini juga boleh digunakan untuk membeli polisi insurans komprehensif bagi motosikal 150cc ke bawah mulai 1 Januari 2022. Diharapkan dengan perluasan skop perlindungan ini, kumpulan B40 terutamanya yang menunggang motosikal untuk mencari rezeki akan memperoleh manfaat daripadanya. Selanjutnya, kerajaan juga bercadang untuk memberikan pengecualian duty stamp kepada produk perlindungan tenang serta produk insurans atau takaful dengan nilai premium atau sumbangan tidak melebihi RM150 bagi individu dan RM250 bagi perusahaan mikro, kecil dan sederhana atau PMKS. Setakat 30 September 2021, My Salam sebagai skim insurans perubatan khas untuk B40 telah membayar tuntutan berkaitan hospitalisasi dan penyakit kritikal sebanyak lebih 180 juta ringgit kepada 125,000 pesakit. Di samping itu, 229,000 individu juga telah menerima pampasan disebabkan COVID-19 dengan nilai keseluruhan 115 juta ringgit. Pada tahun ini, MySkop telah MySalam telah diperluas meliputi tentang tuntutan kos peranti perubatan seperti stand untuk jantung. Bagi tahun harapan, skim My Salam akan diperluas kepada penerima BKM dan manfaat tuntutan kos peranti perubatan juga akan dipanjangkan kepada anak tanggungan penerima My Salam yang layak. 
Inisiatif AI Saraan dilaksanakan bagi menggalakkan pekerja sektor informal menabung untuk hari persaraan melalui caruman KWSP. Melalui inisiatif ini, kerajaan mencarum sebanyak 15% daripada caruman sukarela yang dibuat oleh pekerja sektor informal terhad kepada maksimum RM250 setahun. Bagi tahun 2022, kerajaan akan meluaskan penerimaan manfaat ini untuk turut merangkumi mereka yang berumur antara 55 hingga 60 tahun. Sejumlah 30 juta ringgit disediakan untuk manfaatkan lebih 100,000 peserta sedia ada dan baru. Bagi memberi perlindungan sosial kepada suri rumah dan balu melalui caruman ke KWSP dan Perkeso, kerajaan menyediakan 80 juta ringgit di bawah program Kasih Suri Keluarga Malaysia khusus untuk manfaat mereka hingga umur 55 tahun. Pada tahun ini, kerajaan telah meluaskan liputan perlindungan sosial negara di bawah Perkeso untuk turut mencarum bagi pekerja sendiri dan sektor informal. Bagi tahun hadapan, inisiatif ini diteruskan dengan nilai caruman 80% dan meluaskan manfaatnya kepada sembilan kategori pekerja sendiri baru antaranya petani, nelayan, penjaja, artis, ejen pelancongan dan petugas pemulihan dalam komuniti. Inisiatif ini dijangka memanfaatkan lebih 810,000 pekerja sendiri. Puan Ching Pui Peng dan suaminya yang tinggal di Perak telah hilang mata pencarian. Selain menyara seorang anak, beliau turut menjaga ibunya yang sudah tua. Sepanjang tempoh mencari peluang kerja baru, beliau telah diberikan allowance mencari kerja tambahan di bawah sistem insurans pekerjaan. Wang yang diperolehi, beliau belanjakan sebaiknya untuk menyara keluarga sementara menunggu pekerjaan tetap. Syukur, Puan Ching kini telah kembali bekerja sejak Oktober lalu. Oleh itu, dalam terus membantu individu yang aktif mencari pekerjaan, kerajaan akan meneruskan pemberian allowance mencari pekerjaan kepada pencarum dan bukan pencarum perkeso. Sejak penularan wabak COVID-19, ribuan keluarga Malaysia yang kehilangan punca pendapatan akibat kebatian suami, isteri atau ibu bapa telah menerima faedah pencen penakat di bawah perkeso. Bagi tahun harapan, kerajaan bercadang untuk meningkatkan kadar pencen minimum di bawah skim keilatan daripada 475 kepada 550 ringgit yang akan membantu 56 ribu isi rumah. Selain itu, inisiatif ini diikuti dengan penyelarasan faedah faedah perkeso kepada kos sehari hidup yang dijangka akan memanfaatkan lebih 400 ribu penerima faedah sedia ada. Dengan peningkatan ini, kerajaan juga bercadang meningkatkan siling gaji yang diinsurenskan daripada 4 ribu kepada 5 ribu ringgit untuk menambah baik liputan keselamatan sosial bagi 9 juta pekerja yang dilindungi oleh Perkeso. Secara keseluruhan, inisiatif ini akan melibatkan penambahan faedah Perkeso yang berjumlah 267 juta ringgit. Kerajaan bercadang untuk meluaskan pelepasan cukai sehingga 4000 ringgit kepada pencarum KWSP meliputi caruman secara sukarela seperti mereka yang bekerja sendiri dalam sektor gig. Akhir sekali untuk terus menggalakkan pekerja swasta mencarum dengan perkeso dan melindungi mereka yang kehilangan pekerjaan, had pelepasan cukai dinaikkan daripada 250 kepada 350 ringgit dengan skop pelepasan bagi caruman perkeso terus diperluas meliputi caruman pekerja melalui sistem insurans pekerjaan. Datuk yang dipertua, strategi kedua adalah untuk membangun sebuah keluarga Malaysia. Apalah maknanya keluarga Malaysia tanpa inisiatif menyeluruh buat segenap lapisan masyarakat tanpa mengira bangsa, agama, usia, jantina dan wilayah. Bajet 2022 memastikan agenda pemerkasaan Bumi Putera terus diberi keutamaan dalam usaha untuk merapatkan jurang antar kaum di negara ini. Untuk itu, sejumlah 11.4 bilion ringgit disediakan bagi melaksanakan pelbagai inisiatif di bawah payung pembangunan Bumi Putera. Daripada jumlah tersebut, 6.6 bilion ringgit disediakan bagi kemudahan pendidikan buat anak-anak Bumi Putera antaranya di bawah MARA, UITM dan Yayasan Penaraju. Peruntukan ini disediakan untuk pinjaman pendidikan menaik taraf program sijil ke diploma selain usaha melahirkan profesional dalam kalangan Bumi Putera di bidang perubatan kejuteraan dan kewangan. Manakala sebanyak, sebanyak 4.8 bilion ringgit pula adalah untuk melaksanakan pelbagai program peningkatan kapasiti dan pembiayaan perniagaan di bawah Perbadanan Usahawan Nasional Berhad, Tekun Nasional dan Dana Kemakmuran Bumi Putera. 
sebagai usaha meningkatkan pelibatan syarikat anchor dalam membangunkan vendor Bumi Putera Tempatan. Potongan cukai dua kali bagi perbelanjaan operasi yang layak dinaikkan sehingga RM300,000 kepada sehingga RM500,000 dan dilanjutkan bagi tempoh lima tahun sehingga 31 Disember 2025. Akhir sekali, bagi menggalakkan penyertaan Belia Bumi Putera dalam melaksanakan projek-projek berskala kecil perolehan kerajaan, sebanyak 200 juta ringgit akan disediakan. Sebagai tambahan, kerajaan melalui CIDB akan mewujudkan accelerator program khusus kepada kontraktor Belia G1 hingga G4 melalui kursus peningkatan kapasiti dan on the job training dengan peruntukan 10 juta ringgit. Datuk yang dipertua, aspek pengimarahan syiar Islam berjanji tumpuan dalam bajet 2022. Secara keseluruhan, kerajaan memperuntukkan 1.5 bilion ringgit bagi pengurusan dan pembangunan hal ehwal Islam di bawah Jabatan Perdana Menteri. Di bawah payung pendidikan Islam, kerajaan akan melaksanakan inisiatif berikut. Pertama, membina sebuah sekolah menengah agama di wilayah Persekutuan Labuan dengan kos keseluruhan projek berjumlah 65 juta ringgit. Kedua, meluaskan skop pengajaran takmir di bawah jakim kepada agensi-agensi kerajaan seperti Jabatan Penjara Malaysia, Agensi Anti Dadah Kebangsaan dan Jabatan Kebajikan Masyarakat dengan menambah 1,000 orang guru takmir. Dan ketiga, menyalurkan pemberian khas sekali bayar sebanyak RM500 untuk manfaat 70,000 orang imam, bilal, siak, noja, marbut, guru takmir dan guru kafah. Kerajaan akan terus memperkasa wakaf sebagai instrumen agihan semula kekayaan bagi pembangunan ekonomi ummah. Bagi melahirkan lebih ramai usahawan tani dan pengusaha industri halal serta membantu mereka sekiranya ditimpa bencana, kerajaan akan menyalurkan dana permulaan sebanyak 10 juta ringgit bagi memulakan inisiatif wakaf halal PKS, wakaf pertanian dan wakaf bencana. Syarikat-syarikat korporat dan individu dialu-alukan untuk mewakafkan harta mereka ke dalam tabung ini. Datuk Yang Dipertua, selain daripada program-program nasional untuk manfaat semua, sebanyak 200 juta ringgit turut disediakan khusus untuk kaum Cina. Peruntukan ini antaranya untuk melaksanakan program baik pulih rumah dan kemajuan kampung baru, akses pembiayaan bagi penduduk kampung baru dan skim pembiayaan usahawan PKS. Bagi kaum India pula, sebanyak 145 juta ringgit disediakan antaranya untuk melaksanakan program memperkasa sosial ekonomi komuniti India di bawah unit transformasi masyarakat India dan dana pembiayaan di bawah skim pembangunan usahawan masyarakat India oleh Tekun. Dalam menggalakkan anak-anak Sabah dan Sarawak mendalami ilmu berkaitan budaya dan warisan, sebanyak 10 juta ringgit disediakan untuk tujuan ini. Kepada komuniti orang asli pula, sebanyak 274 juta ringgit diperuntukkan antaranya bagi melaksanakan program peningkatan taraf hidup orang asli seperti pemberian subsidi dan bantuan persekolahan serta bantuan kebajikan untuk manfaat hampir 200,000 orang asli. Untuk tahun harapan, kerajaan akan menaikkan kadar wang saku murid sekolah menengah kepada RM4 sehari. Bagi mendongkong agenda perbaduan dan budaya sukarela di peringkat komuniti, kerajaan menyediakan geran RM6,000 untuk setiap kawasan rukun tetangga atau KRT. Lebih 8,000 KRT akan menerima manfaat daripada geran ini dengan peruntukan sebanyak 50 juta ringgit. Kerajaan juga memperuntukkan 50 juta ringgit bagi kerja-kerja pembaikan, penyelenggaraan dan pembangunan kecil rumah ibadat di kawasan pihak berkuasa tempatan. Peruntukan ini turut berangkumi pelaksanaan aktiviti-aktiviti komuniti dengan kerjasama pengurusan rumah ibadat dan penduduk setempat. Datuk Yang Dipertua, Bila kita sebut perihal seorang yang bernama wanita, merekalah insan yang begitu istimewa dan patut dihargai sebagai pasangan kita dunia akhirat. Kaum wanita, jika diberi peluang dan ruang, boleh menjadi daya penggerak utama produktiviti dan ekonomi negara. Kita seharusnya memastikan kaum wanita dapat memenuhi potensi mereka dalam menyumbang kepada kesejahteraan kita bersama. Sumbangan wanita dalam ekonomi tidak pernah dinafikan, malah perlu diperkukuh. Buat masa ini, golongan wanita memegang 25% daripada komposisi, komposisi ahli lembaga pengarah bagi 100 syarikat awam utama. Namun masih terdapat 27% atau 252 syarikat-syarikat tersenarai di Bursa Malaysia yang belum mempunyai komposisi pengarah wanita. Bagi mengiktiraf peranan wanita dalam proses membuat keputusan 
dan memperkukuh kepimpinan serta keberkesanan lembaga, lembaga pengarah kerajaan melalui Suruhanjaya Security akan mewajibkan pelantikan sekurang-kurangnya seorang pengarah wanita bagi semua semua syarikat senarai awam. Cadangan ini dijangka berkuat kuasa pada 1 September 2022 bagi syarikat bermodal besar dan 1 Jun 2023 bagi syarikat tersenarai lain. Selain itu, kerajaan juga menyediakan 5 juta ringgit kepada Yayasan Kepimpinan Wanita bagi merancakkan penyertaan wanita dalam sektor ekonomi melalui antaranya latihan kepimpinan muda dan program perusahawanan. Bagi membantu usahawan wanita yang turut terkesan akibat COVID-19 serta sebagai langkah meningkatkan kapasiti perniagaan mereka, sejumlah 230 juta ringgit dana pembiayaan akan disediakan antaranya melalui program Dana Nita di bawah Mara dan Tekun Nita di bawah Tekun. Kerajaan juga akan melaksanakan program My Kasih Capital untuk menggalakkan wanita menjana pendapatan dari rumah. Insentif dalam bentuk bantuan asas modal perniagaan akan diberikan di samping program bimbingan bagi menggalakkan perniagaan secara dalam talian. 5,000 peserta termasuk 2,000 ibu tunggal akan meraih manfaat daripada program ini. Bagi menambah baik sistem sokongan sedia ada buat kaum ibu berkerjaya, 30 juta ringgit disediakan untuk menyediakan kemudahan taska di bangunan-bangunan kerajaan, terutamanya di hospital dan universiti awam. Kerajaan juga menggalakkan majikan sektor swasta untuk pengaturan kerja fleksibel serta menyediakan kemudahan taska di pejabat. Untuk itu, selain insentif cukai, kerajaan turut akan meminda garis panduan bagi memendarkan taska, ber, tas, taska beroperasi di aras melebihi tingkat satu pejabat. Sebagai mengiktiraf wanita bekerjaya yang menguruskan anak-anak mereka ketika waktu bekerja, Kerajaan bercadang untuk melanjutkan pelepasan cukai pendapatan individu sehingga RM3,000 bagi bayaran yuran taska dan tarta sehingga takiran 2023. Kita harus akui pada tangan suri kita tersemat keringat yang menghayun buayan yang memupuk, yang memupuk dan sama menyumbang kepada kehidupan. Namun, kadang-kadang ada pula tangan-tangan lain yang tidak mengerti perjuangan seorang ibu, isteri dan puteri sehingga tergamak sehingga tergamak berlaku berkelakuan tidak manusiawi. Ini tidak sepatutnya berlaku. Oleh itu, dalam perjuangan menoktahkan kerakusan ini, kerajaan bersedia untuk memperuntukkan 13 juta ringgit khas untuk memperkasa bahagian D11 polis di Raja Malaysia bagi siasatan seksual wanita dan kanak-kanak termasuk pewujudan 100 100 penjawatan terbaru. Di samping itu, program kesedaran komuniti berhubung keganasan terhadap wanita di seluruh negara melalui skuad wajah akan dilaksanakan. Selain itu, bagi melindungi kebajikan lebih, lebih ramai mangsa keganasan rumah tangga, kerajaan akan juga menambah pusat sokongan sosial setempat serta bekerjasama dengan NGO untuk meningkatkan bilangan rumah perlindungan khas wanita. Aspek kesihatan dan kebersihan diri remaja wanita amat penting dalam mengurangkan sebarang risiko kesihatan dan keciciran di sekolah. Timbalan saya yang berhormat paya besar dalam sebuah sesi libat urus telah mengenal pasti satu isu serius. Dianggarkan 130,000 remaja wanita dari keluarga B40 di Malaysia tidak, tidak mendapat akses kepada produk kebersihan seperti tuala wanita atas sebab kekangan kewangan. Oleh itu, Lembaga Penduduk dan Pembangunan Keluarga Malaysia dengan kerjasama Jabatan Penjara Malaysia akan mengedarkan secara percuma kit asas kebersihan diri setiap bulan kepada 130,000 remaja wanita golongan B40. Di samping itu, kempen dan pendidikan kesihatan reproduktif juga akan terus dijalankan di sekolah-sekolah dengan kerjasama pihak NGO. Selanjutnya, berhubung segmen kesihatan wanita juga Sejumlah lebih 11 juta ringgit disediakan sebagai subsidi ujian mamogram kepada wanita berisiko tinggi dan melaksanakan ujian saringan kanser cervix kepada wanita. Datuk yang dipertua. Minum dulu, minum. Minum sikit, eh? Ya, minum dulu. Kerajaan ini akan terus giat melaksanakan program-program pembangunan sosial ekonomi dan memelihara kebajikan komuniti tumpuan terutamanya melibatkan warga emas, kanak-kanak OKU dan lain-lain. Menjelang tahun 2030, Malaysia bakal dikategorikan, bakal dikategorikan sebagai negara menua 
bagi memastikan setiap warga emas yang memerlukan mendapat sokongan berterusan, bajet ini menyediakan lebih 635 juta ringgit khusus untuk bantuan kebajikan institusi penjagaan dan pusat aktiviti warga emas. Aspek keselamatan kanak-kanak adalah penting, lebih-lebih lagi ketika kita sedang berada di jalan raya untuk menuju ke suatu destinasi. Bagi memastikan penggunaan kursi keselamatan kanak-kanak di dalam kereta, kerajaan akan mensubsidi 50% atau sehingga RM150 untuk pembelian kursi keselamatan kanak-kanak oleh keluarga B40. Sejumlah 30 juta ringgit disediakan untuk tujuan ini dan berbakal memanfaatkan 188,000 keluarga B40. Selanjutnya, aspek kesihatan kanak-kanak juga perlu dititik beratkan. Masalah kurang zat terutamanya dalam kalangan kanak-kanak miskin bandar sangat membimbangkan. Bagi tahun hadapan, kerajaan menjadikan 24 juta ringgit. Pertama, meluaskan program community feeding kepada kanak-kanak daripada keluarga keluarga miskin bandar di Selangor, Johor, Pulau Pinang, Kuala Lumpur dan Putrajaya dengan sasaran untuk menyediakan makanan tambahan lima kali seminggu kepada 100 kanak-kanak berusia 1 hingga 6 tahun. Kedua, meluaskan skop penerima bantuan program pemulihan kanak-kanak kekurangan zat makanan bagi manfaat lebih 1,100 kanak-kanak. Dan ketiga, menubuhkan bank susu ibu untuk bayi peramatang di neonatal care unit melibatkan hospital di Pulau Pinang, Johor, Terengganu, Sabah dan Sarawak. Datuk yang dipertua, kebajikan golongan OKU tidak pernah dilupakan. Bagi tahun hadapan, kerajaan menyediakan peruntukan khusus 30 juta ringgit bagi menaik taraf infrastruktur bangunan kerajaan supaya mesra OKU. Peruntukan ini antaranya untuk menyediakan lebih banyak laluan khas bagi kegunaan golongan cacat penglihatan. Selain itu, 10 juta ringgit juga diperluaskan ataupun diperuntukkan untuk pusat latihan berdikari serta sebuah pusat latihan perindustrian dan pemulihan kerajaan bagi melaksanakan program latihan dan bimbingan ajar kepada golongan OKU. Bagi memastikan tempat buat anak muda OKU mencuburi bidang pekerjaan, kerajaan akan menjadikan kuota khas sebanyak 1% untuk program My Step kepada golongan OKU. Mungkin tidak ramai yang mengenali gerangan Puan Tan Li Bi, Khairun Nisa Ko Abdullah, Wan Zuraida Abu dan Goh Suleng. Mereka lah sebenarnya yang berjasa sebagai jurubahasa isyarat yang sering kita lihat di sudut kaca televisyen. Bagi meningkatkan akses terhadap media di samping membolehkan golongan OKU capna dengan berita semasa dan informasi terkini dengan bantuan bernama, semua rangkaian TV termasuk saluran swasta akan menyediakan jurubahasa isyarat dalam penyampaian berita mereka. Bagi tahun hadapan, Kerajaan bersetuju, ya, bagi tahun harapan kerajaan bersetuju untuk menanggung sepenuhnya bayaran lesen kenderaan motor kepada semua kenderaan persediaan yang dimiliki oleh OKU. Harapnya ini sedikit sebanyak meringankan kos sara hidup golongan OKU. Program pemulihan dalam komuniti merupakan under medium intervensi awal untuk anak-anak kurang upaya meningkatkan kemahiran diri dan mencuburi pekerjaan. Setakat ini, USM merupakan universiti utama yang melaksanakan program ini. Tahun hadapan, kerajaan bercadang untuk meluas pelaksanaannya ke universiti-universiti awam lain. Datuk yang dipertua, pemuda-pemudi belia negara ialah penentu pada jatuh bangunnya negara ini. Pendedahan kepada alam pekerjaan amat penting untuk mereka berhadapan dengan dunia sebenar yang kian mencabar. Sejak 2019, kerajaan telah mula membayar allowance sebanyak RM900 kepada pelajar yang menjalani program latihan industri. Oleh itu, saya menyeru agar pihak swasta turut memberi elawan sekurang-kurangnya RM900 atas khidmat pelajar tersebut. Selain itu, kerajaan akan menyediakan insentif kepada majikan yang menggaji perantis lepasan sekolah dan graduan berumur 18 hingga 30 tahun sebanyak RM900 sebulan bagi tempoh 6 bulan iaitu meningkat berbanding RM800 sebelum ini. Bagi belia yang mencuburi bidang keusahawanan pula, Pelan pembiayaan sebanyak 150 juta ringgit akan disediakan di bawah Bank Simpanan Nasional dan Agrobank. Kerajaan bercadang untuk melanjutkan galakan cukai bagi program latihan industri berstruktur sehingga tahun taksiran 2025 dan turut diperluas kepada pelajar di peringkat izajah sarjana, sijil profesional serta sijil kemahiran Malaysia di tahap 1 dan 2. Bagi memupuk budaya transaksi tanpa tunai di premis perniagaan, kerajaan memperkenalkan program e-start iaitu sebuah skim transaksi tanpa tunai. E-Start akan mengkreditkan RM150 secara one-off 
kepada akaun e-dompet para belia berumur 18 hingga 20 tahun dan juga pelajar sepenuh masa di institusi pengajian tinggi. Dengan peruntukan 300 juta ringgit, kerajaan berharap, berharap lebih 2 juta, 2 juta belia yang menerima manfaat dari daripada program ini dapat menggunakan sebaiknya melalui pembelian berguna seperti buku dan kelengkapan pembelajaran. Lagu Negaraku yang berkumandang di bumi Tokyo menandakan kejayaan atlet kita berangkul pingat emas di kejohanan Paralimpik Tokyo. Tahniah diucapkan khususnya kepada Bonnie Bunya Agustin, Chia Lip Ho dan Abdul Latif Romli serta seluruh kartijen negara atas pencapaian membanggakan ini. Menjelang Paralimpik Paris 2024, kejayaan yang lebih besar pastinya menjadi sasaran. Bagi memperkasa sukan OKU, 10 juta ringgit diperuntukkan kepada Majlis Sukan Negara untuk meningkatkan program latihan atlet OKU dan melaksanakan Liga Sukan OKU. Dalam konteks yang lebih luas, bajet ini turut menjadikan 159 juta ringgit bagi membina, menaik taraf dan menyelenggara kemudahan sukan di seluruh negara. Peruntukan ini antaranya untuk memulakan pembinaan sebuah stadium di Bukit Merbau, Pasir Putih, Kelantan. Merangkumi pelbagai fasiliti sukan seperti gelanggang hoki, lapang sasar menembak dan pusat akuatik. Bagi memastikan rakyat kembali aktif selepas selaras dengan pemulihan pasca COVID-19, kerajaan akan memperuntukkan 50 juta ringgit bagi melaksanakan program seperti pembudayaan gaya hidup aktif, fit forever dan penganjuran hari sukan negara. E-sukan kini sudah menjadi fenomena baru dalam kalangan anak muda dan dilihat mempunyai prospek terbaik pembangunan sukan negara. Bagi merancakkan pentubuhan, pertumbuhan e-sukan, 20 juta ringgit disediakan bagi pembangunan e-sukan kebangsaan termasuk 5 juta ringgit untuk mewujudkan pusat kecemerlangan sukan drone. Saya amat gembira apabila membaca berita bahawa terdapat atlet e-sukan anak tempatan yang berjaya meraih pencapaian cemerlang di kejohanan antarabangsa di Romania baru-baru ini. Kejayaan seperti ini adalah bukti bahawa negara kita mempunyai bakat-bakat muda yang perlu disokong dan digilap. Bagi mengiktiraf pencapaian atlet isukan kelahiran Malaysia yang telah mengharumkan nama seperti Nothing to Say, Ex Nova, Mushi dan Oli, kerajaan bercadang untuk memberikan pengecualian cukai pendapatan ke atas wang hadiah kemenangan kejohanan isukan yang layak. Industri sukan juga terjejas akibat pandemik COVID-19. Larangan aktiviti sukan tertentu telah menyebabkan banyak pengusaha fasiliti sukan berdepan cabaran untuk memulakan semula perniagaan mereka setelah ekonomi kembali dibuka. Untuk meringankan keperluan kewangan pengusaha, Bank Simpanan Nasional akan menyediakan dana pembiayaan hingga 50 juta ringgit dengan kaedah-faedah 0% untuk 6 bulan pertama dan moratorium untuk 6 bulan untuk pengusaha sukan. Strategi ketiga. Strategi ketiga adalah untuk membina kehidupan yang kondusif. Usaha di bawah strategi ini tertumpu kepada meringankan kos sara hidup, menggalakkan pemilikan rumah kediaman, akses kepada kemudahan pengangkutan, pembangunan infrastruktur luar bandar, serta pertahanan dan keselamatan awam. Datuk Yang Dipertua, secara keseluruhan, kerajaan menyediakan lebih RM31 bilion ringgit khusus untuk subsidi, bantuan dan insentif bagi bajet 2022. Perutukan ini adalah untuk meminimum kesan peningkatan kos sara hidup rakyat melibatkan kawalan harga barang dan perkhidmatan. Bagi memastikan kawasan luar bandar khususnya di Sabah dan Sarawak mendapat barangan keperluan asas seperti LPG dan petrol pada harga yang berpatutan, kerajaan memperuntukkan 200 juta ringgit untuk membiayai kos-kos pengangkutan dan pengedaran barangan asas di kawasan luar bandar. Kerajaan amat memahami kekangan kewangan yang dihadapi oleh rakyat akibat PKP yang berpanjangan, terutamanya dari segi pengaliran dari pengurusan aliran tunai. Untuk menambah wang dalam tangan kepada rakyat, KWSP akan melanjutkan tempoh pengurangan kadar caruman minuman, eh, minimum KWSP daripada 11 kepada 9% sehingga Jun 2022 melibatkan anggaran nilai 2 bilion ringgit. Untuk mengurangkan kos pemilikan kenderaan, kerajaan juga akan melanjutkan 100% pengecualian cukai jualan ke atas kenderaan penumpang CKD dan 50% ke atas CBU termasuk MPV dan SUV selama 6 bulan sehingga 30 Jun 2022. Datuk Yang Dipertua, setiap daripada keluarga Malaysia berhak memiliki rumah kediaman sebagai keperluan kehidupan. Untuk itu, kerajaan akan meneruskan projek-projek perumahan khususnya kepada golongan berpendapatan rendah 
dengan nilai keseluruhan 1.5 bilion ringgit. Peruntukan ini antaranya bagi meneruskan program-program rumah mesra rakyat dan bantuan menyelenggara perumahan rakyat. Pada masa yang sama, kerajaan tidak lagi mengenakan cukai keuntungan harta tanah bagi pelupusan oleh individu warga negara, permasalahan tetap dan selain syarikat mulai tahun ke-6 dan ke atas. Saya mendengar keluhan pekerjaan, pekerja gig, pengusaha kecil dan petani yang suka membeli rumah kerana tiada pendapatan tetap sehingga menyebabkan mereka sukar mendapatkan pinjaman perumahan. Antara, ada antara mereka yang sebenarnya mempunyai keupayaan untuk membayar balik pinjaman tetapi tiada bukti pendapatan tetap. Untuk tahun hadapan, bagi membantu kumpulan ini membeli rumah, kerajaan menyediakan jaminan sehingga RM2 bilion ringgit kepada bank melalui skim jaminan kredit perumahan untuk memberi akses pembiayaan kepada golongan ini membeli rumah. Datuk yang dipertua, penduduk di pedalaman Sabah dan Sarawak ada yang terpaksa menempuh jalan balak dan memakan masa berjam-jam untuk mendapatkan perkhidmatan di pekan berdekatan. Kerajaan memahami kesukaran yang dihadapi oleh mereka seperti penduduk di Kudat dan Long Pasiah di Sabah serta Bakalalan dan Bario di Sarawak. Oleh itu, bagi tahun hadapan, kerajaan akan terus memberikan subsidi sebanyak RM209 juta ringgit bagi perkhidmatan pengangkutan udara untuk manfaat penduduk setempat. Saya tertarik dengan perkhidmatan tren yang kini sedang tular iaitu Train to Dabong. Dabong di Kuala Kerai, Kelantan memang merupakan kawasan tumpuan bagi aktiviti eko pelancongan dan harga tambang tiket kereta api untuk ke sana juga adalah berpatutan. Perkhidmatan tren KTMB sememangnya sentiasa penuh pada hujung minggu. Pada hari-hari biasa pula kebanyakan penumpang merupakan murid-murid sekolah. Mereka kini menerima manfaat di bawah inisiatif PAS My Rail 5 yang cuma berharga RM5 sebulan untuk perjalanan tanpa had. Oleh itu, kerajaan akan meneruskan pemberian subsidi bagi menampung sebahagian kos operasi perkhidmatan tren kurang ekonomik di luar bandar, terutamanya di wilayah timur dan meneruskan inisiatif PAS My Rail 5 uh, untuk manfaat murid sekolah. Selain itu, kerajaan juga menyediakan RM80 juta ringgit sebagai dana bantuan sementara bas henti-henti untuk manfaat pengendali bas henti-henti dan RM115 juta ringgit bagi inisiatif PAS perjalanan bas tanpa rail tanpa had dengan harga RM50 sebulan untuk pengguna terutamanya di Lembah Kelang. Datuk Yang Dipertua, kerajaan akan terus menambah baik aspek kesejahteraan penduduk luar bandar dalam usaha mengurangkan jurang pembangunan antara wilayah. Bagi tahun hadapan, lebih RM2.5 bilion ringgit disediakan bagi melaksanakan program berikut. Pertama, hampir RM1.5 bilion ringgit untuk projek jalan luar bandar dan jalan perhubungan desa sebanyak 519 km bagi manfaat lebih 130,000 penduduk setempat. Kedua, 382 juta ringgit bagi bekalan air luar bandar dan bekalan air alternatif dengan sasaran 4,800 buah rumah. Ketiga, 485 juta ringgit untuk bekalan elektrik luar bandar dengan sasaran lebih 2,100 buah rumah. Dan keempat, 107 juta ringgit bagi memasang 7,000 unit lampu jalan kampung penyelenggara lebih 500,000 unit lampu jalan kampung dan menaik taraf 20 buah jabatan uzur serta kerja-kerja awalan bagi 30 buah jabatan baru. Daripada keseluruhan peruntukan ini, sebahagian besar iaitu RM1.5 bilion ringgit disediakan untuk pembangunan infrastruktur luar bandar Sabah dan Sarawak. Datuk Yang Dipertua, kemakmuran ekonomi tidak akan tercapai tanpa negara yang aman dan damai. Bagi tahun hadapan, Bajet ini menyediakan peruntukan kepada Kementerian Pertahanan dan Kementerian Dalam Negeri masing-masing sebanyak 16 bilion dan 17 bilion ringgit. Antaranya sejumlah 1.6 bilion ringgit diperuntukkan untuk mempertingkatkan kesiagaan aset-aset utama Angkatan Tentera Malaysia. Peruntukan ini turut melibatkan 14 juta ringgit bagi mengganti peralatan utama Paskal dan Paskau seperti payung terjun, alat selam litar tertutup dan bot. Kebajikan anggota-anggota polis dan tentera kita juga tetap menjadi keutamaan. Bagi tahun hadapan, 230 juta ringgit disediakan untuk kerja-kerja menyelenggara sekolah dalam kem tentera, tentera, fasiliti ketenteraan dan rumah keluarga angkatan tentera. Peruntukan ini turut melibatkan penggantian dan pembaikan lift serta kuartus PDRM. Ke arah memperpukuh kedaulatan negara, kerajaan akan menambah 8 pos kawalan pasukan gerakan am antaranya di Pagalungan di Sabah dan Temung Mura di Sarawak 
bagi meningkatkan kawalan keselamatan sempadan yang berterusan oleh anggota penguatkuasaan. Selain itu, kerajaan juga akan menambah empat pintu masuk imigresen baru, antaranya di Teluk Melano dan Balik Sarawak, bagi memenuhi keperluan peningkatan pergerakan melalui imigresen susulan perubahan ibu negara Indonesia ke Kalimantan dan pembukaan lebur raya Pan Borneo jajaran Teluk Melano. Dalam menghadapi musim banjir monsun timur laut, kesiapsiagaan agensi pengurusan bencana negara adalah amat penting. Bagi tahun 2022, peruntukan, peruntukan sebanyak 100 juta ringgit disediakan. Antaranya bagi meringankan beban mangsa banjir melalui pemberian kit makanan. Selanjutnya, kerajaan akan melaksanakan inisiatif Malaysian Incentive Community Empowerment melalui pemberian geran sehingga RM10,000 kepada 2,000 pertubuhan yang berdaftar dengan Jabatan Pendaftaran Pertubuhan Malaysia dalam kategori kebajikan, sosial, keselamatan dan hak asasi. Inisiatif ini melibatkan peruntukan sebanyak RM20 juta. ringgit. Datuk Yang Dipertua, daripada secekal-cekal peniaga kecil hinggalah sebesar syarikat multinasional, semua segmen perniagaan menerima impak langsung daripada krisis COVID-19. Misalnya, dilaporkan bahawa lebih 37,000 perniagaan PKS telah ditutup semenjak krisis ini bermula. Dalam meminimum kesan ini, kerajaan telah umumkan pelbagai inisiatif melalui pakej-pakej bantuan dan rasangan bagi memastikan kelangsungan perniagaan. Dengan kebanyakan sektor ekonomi kini kembali beroperasi, permintaan domestik dijangka memulih. Namun, masih terdapat sebilangan segmen ekonomi yang terjejas teruk memerlukan sokongan untuk bangkit semula dan membina daya tahan. Maka, fokus kedua iaitu perniagaan yang berdaya tahan akan menumpukan kepada strategik untuk mengembalikan keupayaan perniagaan melalui akses kepada pembiayaan, memacu pelaburan strategik dan memulih sektor-sektor tumpuan. Dalam mengendali keupayaan perniagaan dalam strategi pertama, kerajaan sebagai pemudah cara akan memperbanyak akses pembiayaan kepada sektor perniagaan terutamanya untuk pengusaha PMKS dan sektor informal. Berdasarkan sesi libat urus yang telah saya hadiri dengan pelbagai pihak, akses kepada kemudahan pembiayaan kerap kali dibangkitkan baik oleh usahawan kecil maupun syarikat besar. Untuk itu, bagi tahun 2022, pakej pembiayaan dengan nilai keseluruhan berjumlah 40 bilion ringgit disediakan di bawah program Semarak Niaga Keluarga Malaysia atau Semarak Niaga. Skim pembiayaan ini merangkumi pinjaman langsung, jaminan pembiayaan dan suntikan ekuiti dengan sasaran untuk memanfaatkan setiap golongan usahawan tidak kira perusahaan mikro ataupun syarikat tersenarai awam. Tahun depan, pembiayaan kredit mikro bernilai hampir 1.8 bilion ringgit akan disediakan melalui pelbagai agensi seperti Tekun, Agrobank, BSN, Bank Rakyat dan Bank Negara Malaysia. Yang amat berhormat, Perdana Menteri Peka akan perlunya akses kepada pembiayaan tanpa faedah disediakan terutamanya bagi membantu para peniaga kecil. Dengan itu, skim pembiayaan informal dan mikro di bawah tekun akan menawarkan pinjaman sehingga RM10,000 pada kadar faedah 0% bersama peserta moratorium selama 12 bulan dengan keutamaan diberikan kepada peniaga sektor informal dan mikro. Selain itu, BSN dan Agrobank juga akan menawarkan pinjaman mikro sehingga RM75,000 pada kadar 0% juga untuk enam bulan pertama serta kemudahan moratorium sehingga enam bulan. Menyedari kepentingan subangan gerakan koperasi, kerajaan akan meneruskan program transformasi ekonomi gerakan koperasi atau transfer dengan peruntukan sebanyak 10 juta ringgit bagi memulihkan aktiviti koperasi yang terjejas. Di samping itu, dana sebanyak 30 juta ringgit akan disediakan untuk program pembiayaan intervensi pemulihan ekonomi koperasi. Pada masa sama, bagi menyokong aktiviti perniagaan oleh koperasi, program seperti penyediaan tapak perniagaan food truck di kawasan bandar utama akan dilaksanakan melalui Suruhanjaya Koperasi Malaysia. Kerajaan juga, kerajaan juga menyokong peluasan program I Tekat, iaitu sebuah program kewangan sosial yang menawarkan modal permulaan, kredit mikro dan latihan kemahiran kepada usahawan mikro dengan peruntukan sebanyak 20 juta ringgit. Datuk yang dipertua, untuk syarikat yang berdaya maju namun mempunyai kekangan mendapatkan dana baru kerana terjejas oleh situasi semasa, kerajaan dan institusi kewangan telah berangka satu pembiayaan bentuk baru yang lebih anjal bagi membolehkan syarikat mempunyai lebih keupayaan untuk memulihkan perniagaan. 
Satu perkembangan menarik sewaktu pandemik ini ialah peningkatan pesat dalam pembiayaan melalui kaedah equity crowd financing dan peer-to-peer -peer financing iaitu lebih 1.3 bilion ringgit dana diperolehi melalui kaedah-kaedah ini sejak tempoh pandemik bermula. Makanya bentuk pembiayaan sebegini akan terus disokong dengan peruntukan 80 juta ringgit secara grant padanan untuk Malaysia Co-Investment Fund tambahan kepada pelaburan oleh BPMB sebanyak 100 juta ringgit. Bagi membantu syarikat yang berdepan masalah gearing atau leverage, kaedah perdanaan pendanaan bernilai 2.1 bilion ringgit melalui pelaburan equity dan quasi equity akan diperkenalkan. Kaedah ini akan diterajui oleh SME Bank dengan kerjasama teraju dan BSN dengan dengan dana bernilai 600 juta ringgit dan terbuka kepada semua terutamanya usahawan Bumi Putra. Selain itu, BPMB ataupun Bank Pembangunan akan menawarkan skim reset atau rehabilitation and support through equity. Dan BNM juga menyediakan Business Recapitalization Fund bernilai RM1 bilion untuk tujuan yang sama. Secara keseluruhan, sejumlah RM14.2 bilion dana tersedia untuk PKS. Untuk kesediaan dana yang berterusan, dana khas BNM, terutamanya Targeted Relief dan Recovery Facility, telah ditingkatkan sebanyak RM2 bilion dan menjadikan jumlah ketersediaan pelbagai dana PKS BNM pada masa ini sebanyak RM11.2 bilion. Selain itu, institusi kewangan seperti SME Bank, PUNB, BPMB, Agro Bank, MNDF dan MARA turut menyediakan dana untuk PKS. Satu inisiatif khusus untuk membantu syarikat tersenarai di bursa juga akan diperkenalkan. Inisiatif ini bertujuan membantu syarikat berdaya maju tetapi terkesan akibat pandemik COVID-19 mendapat sundikan dana tambahan melalui sebuah SBV milik kerajaan dalam bentuk instrumen equity atau instrumen lain yang berkaitan. Untuk tujuan ini, Khazanah Nasional Berhad akan diberi mandat bagi membantu kerajaan menyediakan infrastruktur untuk mentadbir dana bersaiz sekurang-kurangnya RM3 bilion. Ringgit. Datuk yang dipertua, sehingga kini Syarikat Jaminan Pembiayaan Perniagaan atau SJPP telah memberikan jaminan pembiayaan perniagaan bernilai lebih RM46 bilion ringgit kepada lebih RM44,000 syarikat. Ia telah membantu memudahkan PKS mendapat pembiayaan terutamanya dalam tempoh sukar ini. Lantaran itu, SJPP akan ditambah baik dengan menyediakan jaminan untuk pembiayaan yang dijadual dan distruktur semula dengan tambahan had jaminan sebanyak RM10 bilion termasuk RM2 bilion dihaskan untuk Bumi Putra. Ini akan membantu syarikat mendapatkan pembiayaan baru yang sebelum ini sukar diperolehi. Untuk mengurangkan kos transaksi, transak, transaksi pengecualian duty stamp akan dibenar, diberikan ke atas dokumen transaksi penjadualan dan penstrukturan semula pembiayaan. Datuk Yang Dipertua, untuk memastikan ekonomi dibuka dengan selamat dan mengurangkan risiko penularan virus COVID-19, pematuhan kepada SOP terutamanya di tempat kerja adalah amat penting. Oleh itu, bagi kerja-kerja mengubah suai fasiliti perniagaan supaya mematuhi perniaga keperluan SOP seperti pengudaraan serta ruang duduk pelanggan dan pekerja, Kerajaan bercadang untuk melanjutkan potongan cukai ke atas kos pengubah suaian dan pembaruan premis sehingga RM300,000 sehingga 31 Disember 2022. Selanjutnya, bagi syarikat yang berdaftar di bawah Safe at Work, potongan cukai tambahan sehingga RM50,000 ke atas perbelanjaan sewaan premis penginapan pekerja akan dilanjutkan untuk satu tahun lagi. Bagi menambah peluang penyertaan dalam perolehan kerajaan, syarat keperluan pendaftaran akan dipermudah. Syarikat yang pertama kali mendaftar sijil pendaftaran perniagaan MOF dikenakan bayaran cuma RM150 berbanding RM450 sebelum ini. Sebagai tambahan, syarikat yang beroperasi dari premis perniagaan jenis Soho, Shed, Partition dan Co-working Space juga dibenarkan mendaftar. Untuk memberi kemudahan kepada pelawat perniagaan dan pelabur, sebuah Business Traveller Center telah dibuka di lapangan terbang antarabangsa Kuala Lumpur. Pusat ini memudahkan ketibaan pelawat perniagaan jangka pendek yang dikecualikan kepada daripada menjalani kuarantin wajib tertakluk kepada pematuhan SOP yang ketat. Tahun hadapan, sebuah pusat senti yang sama akan disediakan di Johor untuk pelawat perniagaan jangka pendek dari Singapura dengan kos RM10 juta. Ringgit. Setiap kali saya berjumpa dengan usahawan PMKS, mereka yakin bahawa tahun 2022 ialah masa untuk kembali merancakkan ekonomi negara. Namun setelah dua tahun diselubungi pandemik COVID-19, mereka tetap memerlukan bantuan sebelum boleh bangkit semula sepenuhnya. Oleh itu, kerajaan mencadangkan beberapa inisiatif berikut. Pertama, 
penangguhan bayaran ansuran cukai pendapatan bagi PMKS selama enam bulan sehingga 30 Jun 2022. Kedua, semua perniagaan dibenar membuat pindahan anggaran cukai pendapatan yang dikena bayar dalam bulan ke-11 sebelum 31 Oktober 2022. Ketiga, potongan cukai khas sehingga Jun 2022 kepada pemilik bangunan atau ruang perniagaan yang memberikan pengurangan sewa sekurang-kurangnya 30% dan keempat, kerugian yang terkumpul kerugian terkumpul yang tidak dapat diserap boleh dibawa ke hadapan tu tempoh daripada maksimum 7 tahun taksiran berturut-turut kepada maksimum 10 tahun taksiran berturut-turut. Datuk yang dipertua, kerajaan telah komited untuk memastikan Malaysia terus menjadi destinasi pelaburan yang menarik dan dapat memberi kesan limpahan signifikan kepada ekonomi. Strategi kedua pula adalah untuk memacu pelaburan strategik dalam sektor-sektor utama dan mengukuhkan pemboleh pertumbuhan. Dana khas pelaburan strategik sehingga RM2 bilion ringgit disediakan bagi menarik pelaburan asing strategik dalam kalangan syarikat multinasional, khususnya yang dapat melengkapkan rantaian nilai industri dan memacu penjanaan pekerjaan berteraskan pengetahuan dan peluang pembangunan PKS tempatan. Bagi memperkasa daya pemulihan ekonomi negara, bajet ini memperuntukkan 25 juta ringgit untuk menuruka pelaburan berimpak tinggi dan pasaran ekspor baru melalui misi perdagangan dan pelaburan. Untuk memenuhi keperluan kemahiran terutamanya oleh industri dengan nilai aktiviti tambah tinggi, 80 juta ringgit akan disediakan melalui MITI bagi melatih 20,000 pekerja bagi menyokong kluster industri seperti MRO di Subang, ENE di Kulim dan Kimia di Gebeng. Di samping itu, 50 juta ringgit juga disediakan di melalui pusat pembangunan kemahiran negeri seperti di Sarawak, Johor dan Pulau Pinang bagi meningkatkan tahap kemahiran TVET untuk 5,000 pekerja dalam bidang seperti kimpalan minyak dan gas, otomasi perindustrian dan mekatronik. Saya berpeluang bertemu dengan Encik Kamarul Muhammad, pengasas syarikat Aerodyne Group di Cyberjaya dan berasa amat kagum dengan perkembangan syarikat Bumi Putra ini. Syarikat Aerodyne telah memulakan operasi pada tahun 2014 dengan hanya tiga orang pekerja saja. Pada hari ini, Aerodyne telah berkembang pesat dan dinobatkan sebagai syarikat terbesar di dunia dalam industri perkhidmatan teknologi. Maka, bagi terus menerancapkan pelibatan pemain industri tempatan mencuburi bidang ini, geran padanan bernilai 100 juta ringgit disediakan untuk syarikat PKS Bumi Putra meneroka peluang perniagaan dalam bidang aero angkasa. Bagi meningkatkan produktiviti melalui otomasi, kerajaan turut menyediakan 100 juta ringgit bagi geran padanan otomasi pintar kepada 200 syarikat pembuatan dan perkhidmatan untuk mengotomasikan proses perniagaan mereka. Kerajaan juga akan melanjutkan allowance pelaburan semula tambahan selama dua tahun lagi bagi syarikat sedia ada di Malaysia yang telah tamat tempoh kelayakan EPS dan EPS khas. Ini menjadikan tempoh keseluruhan EPS tambahan ini kepada lima tahun. Langkah ini adalah antara cadangan daripada pasukan petugas khas pemudah cara perniagaan atau pemudah yang telah dipertimbangkan untuk bajet 2022. Maka kerajaan akan terus meneliti cadangan seumpamanya bagi menambah baik kelancaran urusan perniagaan atau ease of doing business demi memacu pelaburan. Dalam melahirkan lebih ramai PMKS halal yang dapat bersaing di peringkat antarabangsa, 25 juta ringgit diperuntukkan kepada Halal Development Corporation untuk melaksanakan pelbagai program termasuk penjenamaan digital produk halal PMKS dan program peningkatan keboleh pasaran produk, produk halal PMKS. Datuk Yang Dipertua, kerajaan menyediakan 423 juta ringgit di bawah MOSTI dan KPT bagi mempergiat aktiviti R&D ke arah mengaplikasikan pembaruan yang selari dengan perkembangan sains dan teknologi. Peruntukan ini termasuk 290 juta 295 juta ringgit kepada universiti awam untuk terus berperanan dalam ekosistem penyelidikan dan inovasi serta menggalakkan kerjasama dengan industri. Selain itu kerajaan juga akan menyediakan 12 juta ringgit secara geran padanan melalui collaborative research and engineering science and technology dalam bidang seperti gallium nitride untuk diaplikasikan dalam LED dan kenderaan elektrik. Bidang fokus R&D ini disyorkan oleh Encik Tan dari Clarion Malaysia semasa sesi dialog saya bersama-sama tokoh industri elektrikal dan elektronik sebelum ini. 
Sejumlah 30 juta ringgit akan disediakan bagi melaksanakan hub inovasi revolusi industri keempat di bawah Taman Teknologi Malaysia sebagai pusat serenti untuk ekosistem inovasi dengan pembangunan kluster teknologi baru muncul seperti drone, robotik dan kenderaan berautonomi. Hub ini dijangka memberi manfaat dan pendedahan kepada 10,000 bakal usahawan. Sebagai contoh kejayaan startup Puan Go Ai Ching dari Pulau Pinang pernah menerima Grand Cradle Fund dan telah mengasaskan PictoChart syarikat yang menyediakan perkhidmatan komunikasi visual melalui infografik menarik. PictoChart telah berjaya menebusi pasaran luar negara dan antara pengguna perkhidmatan mereka ialah kerajaan Amerika Syarikat dan syarikat Disney. Antara infografik yang dipaparkan pada skrin uh, di hadapan yang berhormat sekalian uh, juga menggunakan peris, perisian PictoChart. Bagi menggalakkan kejayaan seperti yang dicapai PictoChart, Cradle Fund sebagai agensi penyelaras ekosistem startup akan diperuntukkan 20 juta ringgit untuk mempergiat usaha memulih dan membina daya tahan ekonomi startup. Selari dengan matlamat rangka tindakan ekonomi digital Malaysia atau My Digital, strategi My Startup akan dilaksanakan secara berfasa untuk memberi manfaat kepada lebih 2,500 syarikat dan mewujudkan 5,000 peluang pekerjaan. Kerajaan, kerajaan juga memperuntukkan sejumlah, sejumlah 45 juta ringgit sebagai galakan transformasi teknologi ke arah revolusi industri keempat atau industri forward dalam kalangan PKS serta syarikat tahap pertengahan bagi sektor pembuatan dan perkhidmatan. Bagi merancangkan inovasi, National Regulatory Sandbox di bawah MOF iaitu Futurize akan digiatkan lagi untuk menjalankan kajian industri dan mengesyorkan langkah melancarkan inovasi dalam masyarakat dan ease of doing business. Datuk Yang Dipertua, GLC memainkan peranan penting sebagai penggerak modal insan dan kewangan serta pemangkin transformasi ekonomi digital. Tahun ini, GLC telah banyak membantu dalam agenda pemulihan negara. Antaranya termasuk pengedaran komputer riba kepada 150,000 pelajar melalui tabung cerdik dan tawaran pekerjaan melalui program MyStep. Untuk tahun 2022, syarikat GLC akan terus memainkan peranan penting dalam memacu pemulihan negara. Antara inisiatif utama yang bakal dilaksanakan termasuklah Pertama, inisiatif jalinan GLC memperkasa PMKS Bagi membantu usahawan melalui inisiatif seperti khidmat nasihat dan sokongan kewangan Dengan dana kolektif bernilai RM5 bilion Kedua, inisiatif jalinan GLC CSR Sejahtera Rakyat Untuk menolong, menolong rakyat melalui inisiatif seperti derma peralatan perubatan dan program beasiswa dengan dana kolektif bernilai 500 juta ringgit. Ketiga, mempercepatkan bayaran kepada vendor selamat selewat-lewatnya 14 hari dari tarikh pengesahan invoice. Keempat, memastikan 40% perolehan tempatan dianugerahkan kepada usahawan Bumi Putra. Kelima, menawarkan 30,000 peluang pekerjaan di bawah program MyStep dan Protege. Dan keenam, mempertingkatkan kerja-kerja sukarela dalam kalangan JLC. Dalam membina daya tahan, syarikat GLC akan terus membuat pelaburan antaranya dalam bidang tenaga boleh diperbarui, pemodenan rantaian bekalan dan infrastruktur 5G. Secara kolektif, sekurang-kurang RM30 bilion akan diperuntukkan untuk perbelanjaan modal dan pelaburan pada tahun hadapan. Diharapkan melalui program Perkukuh Pelaburan Rakyat, GLC akan lebih berdaya tahan dan mempunyai prospek pertubuhan yang lebih baik. Contohnya, Kazanah Nasional Berhad telah menyediakan dana impak sebanyak RM6 bilion sebagai pemangkin kepada pertumbuhan sektor-sektor baharu bernilai tinggi. Datuk Yang Dipertua, bagi strategi ketiga, kerajaan memberi komitmen untuk memulihkan dan memangkinkan pembaruan beberapa sektor tumpuan seperti industri pelancongan, kreatif, peruncitan, pertanian dan komoditi supaya dapat kembali berpasi pada kapasiti maksimum. Sektor pelancongan merupakan industri yang terjejas teruk akibat pandemik COVID-19. Antara yang terkesan sepanjang tempoh ini ialah Encik Jasni Amir, pengarah urusan sebuah agensi pelancongan yang menumpukan kepada pakej haji dan umrah. Sebabkan COVID-19 dan penutupan pintu sempadan antarabangsa, syarikat Encik Jasni tidak dapat beroperasi sepenuhnya. Syarikat beliau bergantung kepada bantuan kerajaan, khususnya program subsidi upah untuk mengekalkan pekerjanya serta menjadualkan semula pinjaman bagi mengurangkan komitmen kewangannya. Bagi membantu pihak seperti Encik Jasni, beberapa inisiatif utama dengan nilai keseluruhan RM1.6 bilion akan dilaksanakan pada tahun depan merangkumi pertama, pelaksanaan program subsidi upah bersasar kepada pemain industri pelancongan. 
Kerajaan akan meneruskan inisiatif PSU khusus kepada pengusaha pelancongan yang mengalami penurunan pendapatan sekurang-kurangnya 30%. Dengan peruntukan sebanyak 600 juta ringgit, inisiatif ini bakal memanfaatkan lebih 26,000 majikan dan 330,000 pekerja. Kedua, pembiayaan khusus bagi sektor pelancongan sebanyak 600 juta ringgit di bawah Penjana Tourism Financing dan Bank Pembangunan Rehabilitation Scheme. Ketiga, bantuan khas kepada lebih 20,000 pengusaha pelancongan yang berdaftar di bawah Kementerian Pelancongan Seni dan Budaya untuk tempoh tiga bulan dengan peruntukan 85 juta ringgit. Keempat. Penyelenggaraan infrastruktur pelancongan dengan peruntukan 50 juta ringgit termasuk bangunan Sultan Abdul Samad serta lembah bujang di Kedah. Kelima, pemberian geran padanan bagi tujuan pembaikan kepada 738 hotel bajet yang berdaftar di bawah Motek, Motek serta geran pembaikan kepada pemilik inap desa berdaftar dengan peruntukan 30 juta ringgit. Keenam, pemberian geran padanan kepada syarikat yang menganjurkan program berkaitan seni dan budaya dengan peruntukan 50 juta ringgit. Dan ketujuh, dana galakan bagi aktiviti promosi serta galakan pelancongan domestik dengan peruntukan 60 juta ringgit. Pelepasan khas sukai perdatan individu bagi perbelanjaan pelancongan domestik sehingga RM1,000 dilanjutkan sehingga tahun taksiran 2022. Kita harus menikmati keindahan serta keberbagaian destinasi pelancongan daripada Taman Iko Rimba di Taman Iko Rimba Bukit Air di Perlis, warisan bersejarah di Kota Afomosa, Melaka, Pantai Teluk Cepedak di Pahang, Kampung Budaya di Kota Kinabalu dan Gudung Santubong di Sarawak. Kerajaan akan menggiatkan lagi usaha pemulihan industri pelancongan kesihatan antarabangsa dengan kadar segera bagi memperkukuh kedudukan Malaysia sebagai destinasi pilihan pelancongan kesihatan dengan peruntukan 20 juta ringgit kepada Malaysia Healthcare Travel Council. Selanjutnya kerajaan bercadang untuk melanjutkan beberapa galakan cukai termasuk pengecualian cukai pendapatan kepada penganjur aktiviti kesenian dan kesenian, kesenian dan kebudayaan serta pertandingan sukan dan rekreasi bertaraf antarabangsa sehingga tahun taksiran 2025. Pengecualian duty, duty hiburan ke atas aktiviti hiburan termasuk taman tema dan panggung wayang di semua wilayah persekutuan. Dan pengecualian cukai pelancongan dilanjutkan lagi sehingga 31 Disember 2022. Pihak negeri juga disaran untuk memberi pengecualian duty hiburan bagi menyokong pemulihan sektor ini. Datuk Yang Dipertua, dalam merancangkan semula aktiviti industri kreatif, Agensi-agensi seperti Finas, Cendana dan My Creative Ventures akan menggiatkan pelbagai inisiatif. Sejumlah 188 juta ringgit disediakan antaranya untuk meneruskan pelbagai inisiatif seperti dana kandungan digital, projek kandungan multimedia digital, insentif filem, program pemukasa modal insan dan perlindungan perkeso kepada golongan artis. Sebagai tambahan, pada tahun harapan kerajaan akan menjayakan program Riuh Keluarga Malaysia melalui dana padanan pinjaman pelaburan berjumlah 20 juta ringgit. Langkah ini dijangka memberi 5000 peluang pekerjaan baru. Nama Upin dan Ipin, Ejen Ali dan Bobo Boy terkenal bukan sahaja di negara kita tetapi tersohor serantau Asia Tenggara. Bagi mempertengahkan lebih banyak animasi tempatan ke pesada antarabangsa, kerajaan memperuntukkan 30 juta ringgit melalui skim padanan pinjaman pelaburan bagi inisiatif pelaburan animasi negara yang akan yang akan dikendalikan oleh My Creative Ventures. Datuk yang dipertua, industri perincitan juga antara yang terjejas disebabkan pandemik. Bagi tahun 2022, tumpuan khas diberikan bagi membantu perusahaan sosial, halal, kraft tangan, pertanian dan usaha tempatan untuk beralih kepada khidmat digital. Melihat kepada kejayaan kempen Shop Malaysia Online dan Go E-Commerce Onboarding yang telah manfaat memanfaatkan lebih dari 500,000 usaha tempatan, kerajaan akan meneruskan program ini dengan peruntukan 250 juta ringgit. Usahawan PMKS layak menerima manfaat sehingga RM2,000 bagi aktiviti penerapan e-dagang, latihan dalam pemasaran dan pembayaran digital. Sebagai inisiatif menyokong pemulihan sektor pelancongan, kerajaan menggalakkan penggunaan baucer Shop Malaysia Online di premis perniagaan dan pembelian tiket tempat, tempat tarikan pelancong seperti Zoo dan Taman Tema. Bagi merancangkan penghasilan dan pembelian produk tempatan, Kerajaan komited untuk melaksanakan inisiatif-inisiatif menyokong produk hasil tangan tempatan dan produk khazanah alam melalui kempen beli barangan buatan Malaysia, program jualan Malaysia dan program khazanah alam industri jualan langsung dengan peruntukan 33 juta ringgit. Saya yakin ramai dalam kalangan kita pernah membeli putu bambu world yang dijual di kencian rehat dan rawat leboraya. 
Pengasasnya Encik Muhammad Hasan bermula dengan hanya sebuah gerai kecil pada tahun 2008 dan dengan papan tanda cardboard yang ditulis tangan. Hari ini bilangan franchise Putu Bambu World di seluruh negara telah pun mencecah 70 cawangan. Kepada yang berminat menjadi usahawan franchise, kerajaan melalui Pernas akan menyediakan 74 juta ringgit antara lain untuk menyediakan program latihan dan bimbingan perniagaan dan skim pembiayaan mudah 0% selama 6 bulan bersama berserta juga dengan moratorium. Datuk yang dipertua, kerajaan akan terus memacu pemodalan sektor pertanian dalam meningkatkan jaminan dan keselamatan makanan serta menjana pendapatan lebih tinggi dan menarik lebih ramai generasi muda agropreneur. Pemberian subsidi dan insentif bagi industri pertanian dan perikanan akan diteruskan dengan peruntukan sebanyak 1.7 bilion ringgit antaranya 1.5 bilion ringgit bagi subsidi benih, baja, harga dan pengeluaran padi termasuk subsidi baja padi Huma sebanyak 40 juta ringgit. Insentif hasil tangkapan nelayan juga turut disediakan berjumlah 150 juta ringgit. Bagi tahun 2022 Inisiatif bagi meningkatkan jaminan bekalan makanan berjumlah 120 juta ringgit akan dilaksanakan seperti berikut. Pertama, pelbagai projek pelbagai projek jaminan bekalan makanan melibatkan pelbagai negeri termasuk pembangunan industri akuakultur dan estet kerang-kerangan di Johor. Kedua, program pemantapan jaminan bekalan makanan negara bagi menyediakan kemudahan logistik dan pusat penyimpanan stok bekalan makanan dan hasil pertanian segar berteknologi tinggi untuk petani dan pengusaha agro makanan. Ketiga, program bantuan insentif makanan ternakan ruminan melalui skim harga bersubsidi dedak isi rong sawit bagi membolehkan peternak kecil ruminan mendapatkan bekalan makanan ternakan dengan harga lebih murah selaras dengan konsep ekonomi kitaran. Dan keempat, program galakan usahawan Tekno PKS bagi meningkatkan hasil pengeluaran tanaman dan pemprosesan makanan melalui aplikasi teknologi untuk manfaat 140 usahawan tani serta program. Dalam usaha meningkatkan kawasan pertanian dan memberi peluang kepada golongan berpendapatan rendah dan belia termasuk graduan untuk menjana pendapatan, dicadangkan tanah terbiar dan tidak dibangunkan milik Kerajaan Persekutuan dan Tanah Rizal Melayu disewakan bagi projek pertanian atau perniagaan. Melalui inisiatif ini, tanah-tanah tersebut juga dapat diuruskan secara optimum dan teratur. Sebagai pelengkap, sebagai pelengkap program pembiayaan sehingga RM1.25 bilion akan disediakan oleh Agrobank dan Bank Negara melalui antaranya Agro Food Facility berjumlah 500 juta ringgit dana, dan dana pembiayaan agro makanan oleh Agro Bank berjumlah 200 juta ringgit. Datuk Yang Dipertua, kerajaan memperuntukkan 2.5 bilion ringgit bagi tahun 2022 untuk terus memperkasa pembangunan masyarakat luar bandar melalui program pembangunan komoditi. Daripada jumlah ini, 1.3 bilion ringgit disalurkan kepada Felda bagi tujuan pakej pemulihan dan pembangunan peneroka. 465 juta ringgit untuk manfaat peserta Felkra dan 660 juta ringgit untuk kemajuan pekebun kecil bagi perusahaan getah di bawah Rizda. Kerajaan akan melaksanakan program transformasi perusahaan getah negara bertujuan menyatukan pekebun kecil, usahawan getah dan koperasi kecil dalam satu konsortium yang lebih besar agar mampu untuk memproses getah sekerap ke bentuk getah krip. Bagi membantu meningkatkan taraf sosioekonomi pekebun kecil kategori B40, Kerajaan akan memperkenal dan memperluas penggunaan teknologi RRIM Hydrobest kepada pekebun kecil melalui geran padanan. Kerajaan juga bertuju untuk meneruskan bantuan musim tengkujuh untuk membantu meringankan beban sara hidup bagi 320,000 pekebun kecil yang kehilangan pendapatan semasa musim tengkujuh dengan peruntukan 190 juta ringgit. Kerajaan juga akan memberikan perlindungan takaful kepada semua ahli peladang PPK seluruh Malaysia di bawah skim perlindungan takaful Smart Card peladang dengan peruntukan sebanyak 5 juta ringgit. Selanjutnya, bagi menyokong industri kelapa sawit, kerajaan memperuntukkan 35 juta ringgit bagi melaksanakan skim rangsangan tanam semula sawit pekebun kecil dan 20 juta ringgit untuk usaha menangani kempen anti minyak sawit di peringkat terbangsa. Akhir sekali untuk tahun hadapan Kerajaan bersetuju menaikkan nilai ambang kenaan levi kutungan luar biasa kelapa sawit bagi semenanjung Malaysia daripada RM2,500 kepada RM3,000 dan bagi Sabah dan Sarawak dari RM3,000 kepada RM3,500. Manakala kadar levi Sabah dan Sarawak diselaraskan kepada RM3,000 seperti mana kadar levi di semenanjung. Datuk Yang Dipertua, fokus ketiga ialah ekonomi yang makmur dan mampan. 
Kerajaan komited untuk mengukuhkan agenda pembangunannya supaya pertumbuhan kekal, mampan dan inklusif. Di samping itu, bajet 2022 akan terus menyokong perlaksanaan Rancangan Malaysia ke-12 yang memberi keutamaan kepada tiga tema iaitu penjanaan semula ekonomi, kesejahteraan dan inklusiviti dan kemampanan ke arah keluarga Malaysia yang makmur sejahtera. Di bawah fokus ini, penempuan akan diberi kepada agenda kelestarian, perapatkan jurang ekonomi, konsolidasi fiskal dan kemampanan hasil serta mendukung penyampaian perkhidmatan awam. Strategi pertama di bawah fokus ketiga adalah untuk mengukuhkan agenda kelestarian negara. Kita komited untuk memenuhi matlamat pembangunan mampan atau SDG dan penggubalan bajet tahunan sudah mula dijajarkan kepada 17 SDG. Bajet kali ini dan tahun-tahun seterusnya juga akan dijajarkan kepada green budgeting bagi beralih ke arah pelaksanaan projek dan program pembangunan bersifat mesra alam. Perubahan iklim merupakan isu sejagat dan impaknya adalah sama buruk seperti pandemik yang kita alami hari ini. Baru-baru ini, Yang Mahabu Ahmad dan Menteri telah menzahirkan komitmen untuk menjadikan Malaysia sebagai sebuah negara neutral carbon seawal-awalnya pada tahun 2050. Komitmen ini memerlukan negara untuk memacu pembaruan supaya pertumbuhan kekal mampan dan berdaya saing di pasaran global. Bagi memenuhi sasaran neutral carbon, inisiatif voluntary carbon market akan dilancarkan di bawah kendalian, kendalian Bursa Malaysia. Inisiatif ini akan bertindak sebagai platform sukarela bagi dagangan kredit karbon antara pemilik aset hijau dengan mana-mana entiti ke arah peralihan amalah, amalan rendah karbon. Selain itu, untuk membantu PMKS meningkatkan amalan lestari dan rendah karbon seperti menambah penggunaan bahan mentah lestari dan tenaga boleh, boleh diperbarui, BNM akan menyediakan kemudahan peralihan kepada rendah karbon dengan nilai dana sebanyak satu bilion ringgit secara padanan dengan dana yang setara daripada institusi, daripada institusi kewangan peserta. Kerajaan melihat ya, potensi kenderaan elektrik atau EV yang memiliki ciri-ciri energy efficient vehicle sebagai usaha meminimum pencemaran asap kenderaan ke udara. Bagi menyokong pembangunan, pembangunan industri EV tempatan. Kerajaan bercadang untuk memberikan pengecualian sepenuhnya ke atas duty import, duty excise dan cukai jualan bagi kenderaan EV. Pengecualian cukai jualan, cukai jual, pengecualian cukai jalan sehingga 100% juga diberikan kepada kenderaan berkenan. Di samping itu, pelepasan cukai pendapatan individu sehingga RM2,500 juga turut diberikan ke atas kos pembelian dan pemasangan sewaan dan sewa beli kemudahan serta bayaran yuran langganan, langganan kemudahan pengecasan EV. Datuk yang, dipertua, Datuk yang dipertua, keindahan alam semula jadi dan kepelbagaian biodiversiti negara merupakan kazanah yang tidak ternilai harganya. Bagi tahun 2022, kerajaan menyediakan 450 juta ringgit kepada pelbagai kementerian untuk melaksanakan beberapa inisiatif antaranya seperti berikut. Pertama, projek pemeliharaan alam seperti Penang Hill Biosphere Reserve dan Tasik Chini Reserve serta projek pemeliharaan alam menangani hakisan pantai di Pantai Merdeka di Kedah dan mengatasi banjir di Melaka. Kedua, program memperkasa pelibatan komuniti tempatan ke tempatan veteran tentera dan orang asli sebab seperti suku Jahai sebagai pengawal biodiversiti kawasan hutan dengan pertambahan pengambilan peronda sehingga 1,000 orang. Ketiga, pemberian bantuan bagi kos operasi zoo, usaha meningkatkan pembiakan harimau Malaya dan pelaksanaan program Frozen Zoo untuk memelihara kelangsungan spesies terancam. Keempat, kempen penanaman 100 penanaman 100 juta pokok dengan sasaran 20 juta ringgit. 20 juta pokok setahun. Kelima, geran sokongan bagi menyokong peranan World Wildlife Fund, kumpulan rentas parti Parlimen Malaysia serta rakan alam sekitar. Bagi menerapkan pelaksanaan Ecological Fiscal Transfer atau EFT, bagi memelihara biodiversiti, peruntukan EFT berjumlah RM70, 70 juta ringgit akan disediakan setiap tahun bagi semua negeri dan mekanisme pelaksana, pelaksanaannya diperkukuh melalui kriteria ekologi berasaskan keberhasilan. Datuk Yang Dipertua, sejak pandemik bermula, pelbagai pihak terutamanya NGO, GLC, perusahaan sosial dan komuniti telah memainkan peranan yang berkesan sebagai ejen di lapangan bagi menyokong usaha kerajaan membangunkan sosioekonomi rakyat. Pada tahun ini, kerajaan bersama-sama Yayasan Hasanah telah membiayai pelbagai inisiatif untuk golongan rentan. Satu contoh penerima grant khas Hasanah ialah Earth Air 
iaitu sebuah perusahaan sosial yang mempromosi barangan-barangan kraf mesra alam yang dihasilkan oleh komuniti tempatan. Saudari Sasibasi Kimis, pengasas Earth Air, bercita-cita besar untuk membantu penghasil kraf ini mengembangkan pendapatan mereka secara mampan. Earth Air dan suku, suku kaum Dusud Minokop di Sabah telah bekerjasama untuk menghasilkan beg yang saya gunakan untuk membawa ucapan bajet 2022 hari ini. Bagi tahun hadapan, sejumlah 100 juta ringgit akan terus disediakan secara geran padanan dengan sumbangan yayasan milik GLC kepada NGO untuk membiayai pelbagai program sosial membantu golongan rentan dari segi pendidikan, penjanaan pendapatan dan kesihatan mental. Pada masa yang sama, bagi memastikan perusahaan sosial seperti Earth Air dapat terus berkembang dan membantu golongan sasaran mereka, kerajaan bercadang untuk memberikan pengecualian cukai ke atas semua pendapatan perusahaan sosial sehingga tiga tahun taksiran berdasarkan kepada tempoh sah laku akreditasi yang diluluskan oleh jawatan kuasa bersama akreditasi oleh Kementerian Pembangunan, Usahawan dan Koperasi serta Yayasan Hasanah. Program perolehan impak sosial kerajaan yang telah diperkenalkan secara rintis sebelum ini bertujuan melibat meningkatkan peluang perusahaan sosial untuk menyertai perolehan kerajaan. Mulai tahun hadapan, inisiatif ini akan diperluaskan pelaksanaannya kepada semua kementerian. Di samping itu, kerajaan juga memperuntukkan 14 juta ringgit kepada United Nations Development Program sebagai menyokong usaha mereka menjalankan pelbagai inisiatif antaranya mewujudkan aktiviti pelancongan selamat dan aktiviti restorasi di Mersing, Johor dan Manjong, Perak. Akhir sekali, sebagai galakan kepada penjawat awam untuk terus serta menyumbang tenaga di dalam khidmat masyarakat Cuti tanpa rekod maksimum lima hari setahun dibenarkan dengan pertubuhan yang diluluskan. Datuk Yang Dipertua, Malaysia komited dalam memenuhi obligasinya sebagai penandatanganan, penandatangan perjanjian Paris. Pada April lalu, kerajaan berjaya menerbitkan suku kelestarian berdaulat yang pertama di dunia menerusi terbitan berjumlah 800 juta dolar Amerika. Suku ini telah dilanggan melebihi 5.6 kali yang mencerminkan keyakinan pelabur terhadap negara. Bagi tahun hadapan, kerajaan akan menerbit suku kelestarian dalam ringgit Malaysia sehingga sepuluh bilion ringgit untuk disalurkan kepada projek sosial atau mesra alam yang layak. Datuk Yang Pertua, strategi kedua dalam fokus ini adalah untuk merapatkan jurang ekonomi berentas dimensi. Tahun 2022 akan turut menumpukan kepada usaha melaksanakan projek-projek utama negara yang berupaya memberi limpahan ekonomi kepada penduduk setempat di samping merapatkan jurang ekonomi antara lokaliti. Bagi memastikan usaha perangsang pemulihan ekonomi di Pergiat, kerajaan akan meneruskan pelaksanaan projek pembangunan infrastruktur negara bernilai 3.5 bilion ringgit antaranya pembinaan lebur raya Pen Borneo dan Central Spine Road. Bagi merancangkan lagi aktiviti pembangunan infrastruktur berimpak tinggi secara kerjasama awam swasta, Kerajaan memperuntukkan dana permulaan sebanyak 200 juta ringgit menerusi pewujudan dana mudah cara infrastruktur ketiga di bawah selian UKAS Jabatan Perdana Menteri. Selanjutnya, kerajaan juga akan terus melaksanakan projek-projek kecil dan sederhana bernilai 2.9 bilion ringgit yang dihususkan kepada kontraktor gelas G1 ke G4 di seluruh negara. Perutukan ini antaranya melibatkan projek projek selenggara jalan baik pulih infrastruktur dan peralatan usang Universiti Awam, Politeknik dan Kolej Komuniti serta projek-projek lain melibatkan amnesti sosial di luar manda. Datuk Yang Dipertua, keseimbangan pembangunan antara negeri dan wilayah adalah penting bagi memastikan kesemua ahli keluarga Malaysia dapat menikmati hasil pembangunan. Bagi lima koridor wilayah pembangunan ekonomi, Projek-projek pembangunan akan diteruskan dengan peruntukan sejumlah 690 juta ringgit merangkumi 6 projek baru dan 66 projek sambungan seperti projek pertanian pinta di Igan, Sarawak. Kerajaan juga akan prihatin membantu kerajaan negeri meningkatkan pembangunan ekonomi negeri. Sumbangan itu peruntukan khusus berjumlah 260 juta ringgit iaitu 20 juta ringgit bagi setiap negeri akan disediakan bagi memfokuskan kepada projek berkenaan jaminan makanan, pelancongan serta pemeliharaan dan pemeliharaan alam sekitar. Seterusnya, Sabah dan Sarawak akan menerima peningkatan peruntukan perbelanjaan pembangunan masing-masing kepada 5.2 bilion ringgit dan 4.6 bilion ringgit. Peruntukan ini antaranya adalah untuk melaksanakan projek infrastruktur air, elektrik dan jalan raya serta kemudahan pendidikan dan kesihatan. 
Usaha bank bergerak yang dimulakan di Sarawak tahun ini seperti di Pekan Sungai Asap Belaga mendapat sambutan memberangsangkan. Penduduk luar, penduduk luar bandar datang beramai-ramai untuk menggunakan perkhidmatan bank bergerak yang disediakan oleh BSN. Baru-baru ini perkhidmatan ini juga dilulus, diluaskan ke Sabah atas usaha yang berhormat si Pitang. Tahun hadapan sebanyak tambahan 20 lagi bank bergerak dijangka mula beroperasi berangkumi 250 kawasan dan mukim di luar bandar terutamanya di Sabah dan Sarawak. Datuk yang dipertua dalam menyediakan kemudahan jalur jalur lebar terkini kepada keluarga Malaysia pelaksanaan inisiatif jalinan digital negara atau jendela akan terus dipergiat. Bagi tahun 2022 kerajaan menyediakan 700 juta ringgit. Kerajaan menjadikan 700 juta ringgit untuk meneruskan usaha ketersambungan digital di 47 kawasan perindustrian dan 630 buah sekolah terutamanya di luar, di luar manda. Bagi memastikan golongan penduduk di PPR tidak ketinggalan, kerajaan juga memperuntukkan 30 juta ringgit bagi menyediakan kemudahan internet di 40 PPR sedia ada. Penyediaan perkhidmatan 5G bakal melakar landscape teknologi baru dan menawarkan pengalaman pengguna yang lebih baik dan pantas. Di samping itu, ia juga merapatkan jurang digital antara mencipta peluang pekerjaan baru. Bagi tahun 2022, perkhidmatan 5G akan diperluas kepada 36% daripada kawasan kepadatan tinggi, termasuk di bandar-bandar utama di Johor, Selangor, Pulau Pinang, Sabah dan Sarawak. Untuk meningkatkan penerapan digital dalam kalangan PMKS, kerajaan akan menambah baik inisiatif skim grant pendigitalan PKS. Untuk tahun 2022, Jumlah dana bagi skim ini telah dinaikkan kepada 200 juta ringgit dengan 50 juta ringgit dikhususkan untuk usahawan mikro bumi putra di luar bandar. Bagi menggiatkan lagi transformasi pendigitalan perniagaan dalam kalangan usahawan luar bandar, Suruhanjaya Komunikasi dan Multimedia Malaysia akan juga mentransformasikan 600 pusat ekonomi digital keluarga Malaysia sebagai pusat serhenti untuk membimbing usahawan mikro menggunakan teknologi digital. Nomad digital ialah golongan yang berjana pendapatan secara dalam talian tanpa lokasi fizikal yang tetap. Golongan ini berpotensi menyumbang kepada ekonomi negara terutamanya sebagai pelancong. Untuk memanfaatkan perkembangan ini, kerajaan akan memperkenalkan program Malaysia Digital Nomad, Malaysia Digital Nomad untuk mewujudkan komuniti dan ekosistem nomad digital di Malaysia dengan menggunakan sektor pelancongan sebagai pemangkin. Datuk Yang Dipertua, Kerajaan telah menangani krisis pandemik COVID-19 dalam keadaan ruang fiskal yang sempit. Memandangkan ekonomi masih belum pulih sepenuhnya dan kutipan hasil yang terjejas. Oleh itu, kerajaan terpaksa bergantung kepada sumber hasil bukan cukai. Di samping meningkatkan hutang statutorinya bagi memastikan pakej bantuan dan rangsangan serta projek pembangunan dapat diteruskan. Bagi tahun 2022, iaitu tahun pemulihan ekonomi, reformasi dan pengukuhan fiskal akan dimulakan bagi membina semula benteng ketahanan fiskal negara dalam menghadapi cabaran di masa hadapan. Bagi inisiatif pertama, kerajaan berhasrat untuk memperkenalkan Akta Tanggungjawab Fiskal dengan tujuan meningkatkan tabib urus, accountability dan ketulusan dalam pengurusan fiskal negara bagi memastikan kemampanan fiskal dan menyokong kestabilan ekonomi makro. Seperti yang telah saya maklumkan, Kertas konsultasi awam berkenaan akta tersebut telah diterbitkan dan semua maklum balas konstruktif akan dipertimbangkan untuk menambah baik draf yang sedang disediakan. Kerajaan bercadang untuk membentangkan akta ini pada tahun hadapan. Selain itu, kerajaan juga sedang melaksanakan public expenditure review dengan kerjasama Bank Dunia bagi memastikan kecekapan dan keberkesanan perbelanjaan awam tanpa menjejaskan sistem penyampaian awam. Dengan itu, produktiviti perbelanjaan awam dapat ditingkatkan lagi memastikan nilai faedah terbaik bagi setiap ringgit duit rakyat. Sebagai inisiatif kedua, langkah kemampanan hasil dan selaras dengan amalan di peringkat antarabangsa, kerajaan bercadang untuk memberikan layanan cukai sama rata seperti berikut. Pertama, kadar duty stamp nota kontrak dinaikkan daripada 0.1% kepada 0.15% dan had duty stamp RM200 setiap nota kontrak dimansuhkan. Pada masa yang sama, aktiviti pembrokeran dagangan saham tersenarai tidak lagi dikenakan cukai perkhidmatan. Kedua, cukai pendapatan dikenakan kepada pemaaf statin di Malaysia ke atas pendapatan yang terbit dari sumber luar negara dan diterima di Malaysia mulai 1 Januari 2022. Ketiga, cukai jualan dikenakan ke atas barang bernilai rendah dari luar negara yang dijual oleh peniaga dalam talian 
dan dihantar kepada pengguna di Malaysia melalui perkhidmatan kuria udara. Keempat, cukai perkhidmatan dikenakan ke atas perkhidmatan penghantaran barang yang disediakan oleh penyedia perkhidmatan termasuk platform e-dagang kecuali perkhidmatan penghantaran makanan dan minuman serta perkhidmatan logistik. Kelima, program khas pengakuan sukarela Jabatan Kastam di Raja Malaysia diperkenalkan secara berfasa dengan insentif remisi penalti sebanyak 100% bagi fasa pertama dan remisi penalti sebanyak 50% bagi fasa kedua. Remisi cukai juga akan dipertimbangkan bagi kes tertentu. Keenam, sijil pematuhan cukai lembaga hasil dalam negeri Malaysia akan dijadikan sebahagian prasyarat untuk syarikat menyertai perolehan kerajaan bermula, bermula 1 Januari 2023. Ketujuh, penggunaan nombor pengenalan cukai atau TIN akan dilaksanakan mulai tahun 2022 bagi memperluaskan asas cukai pendapatan. Dalam meningkatkan disiplin fiskal dan ketulusan serta melengkapi program strategi hasil jangka sederhana serta kajian insentif cukai yang sedang diusahakan, penyata perbelanjaan cukai akan diterbitkan. Ini penting dalam menentukan kos yang ditanggung kerajaan berhubung pemberian insentif cukai, pengecualian cukai secara one-off dan penetapan dasar cukai lain. Datuk Yang Diputera, berikutan krisis pandemik COVID-19, keperluan meningkat untuk membiayai golongan rakyat yang terjejas. Bagi memastikan sistem kesihatan awam lebih berdaya tahan dalam menghadapi sebarang ancaman pada masa depan, kerajaan bercadang untuk memperkenalkan cukai khas secara one-off kepada syarikat yang menjana pendapatan tinggi. Dengan nama Cukai Makmur, syarikat dengan pendapatan bercukai sehingga 100 juta ringgit pertama akan dikenakan cukai pendapatan pada kadar 24% dan pendapatan bercukai selebihnya akan dikenakan cukai pendapatan pada kadar 33% bagi tahun taksiran 2020. Datuk Yang Dipertua, perkhidmatan awam merupakan tunjang dalam usaha kita menangani pandemik COVID-19. Kerajaan amat menghargai sokongan dan pengorbanan setiap penjawat awam dalam melaksanakan program dan projek serta pelbagai pakej bantuan dan rasangan selama ini. Strategi keempat di bawah fokus ketiga adalah untuk mendok terus mendukung penyampaian perkhidmatan awam. Usaha memberikan perkhidmatan berintegriti dan menentukan ketelusan tabi urus kerajaan akan terus dipergiat bagi memastikan penyampaian terbaik kepada rakyat. Bagi memacu transformasi digital dalam perkhidmatan kerajaan, inisiatif My Digital telah dilancarkan pada 19 Februari lalu. Pelaksanaan projek identiti digital nasional akan dimulakan pada tahun 2022 dan merupakan satu platform pengesahan pengenalan diri bagi membolehkan kesaling hubungan pelbagai sistem transaksi untuk memudahkan penggunaan berurusan secara digital dan selamat. Selain itu, My Digital juga menyasarkan penggunaan 80% cloud storage dalam perkhidmatan kerajaan pada tahun 2022. Oleh itu, inisiatif Digital First Program akan diperkenalkan bagi meningkatkan usaha penggunaan pengkomputeran awan. Secara tidak langsung, inisiatif ini akan meminimum penggunaan storan fiskal dan membudaya konsep tanpa kertas. Jika dahulu rakyat perlu pergi ke kaunter-kaunter dan pejabat kerajaan sekiranya ingin berurusan atau mendapatkan sebarang perkhidmatan, kini komitmen untuk memastikan rakyat terutamanya kumpulan tumpuan mendapat akses yang pantas kepada perkhidmatan kerajaan, pelbagai usaha dipergiat antaranya melalui program klinik bergerak, pemberian vaksin COVID-19 bergerak dan bank bergerak. Bagi tahun hadapan, kerajaan akan meluaskan perkhidmatan klinik bergerak oleh Hospital Pengajar Universiti sebagai usaha menambah akses saringan dan pendidikan kesihatan di kawasan-kawasan tumpuan. Selain itu, sebagai tambahan, Jabatan Pengangkutan Jalan juga akan menyediakan sebanyak 20 kaunter bergerak JPJ khusus untuk manfaat penduduk pendalaman. Bagi meneruskan akses perkhidmatan kerajaan pada luar waktu pejabat, sebanyak 100 kios dengan fleksibiliti lengkap komputer akan disediakan di UTC untuk memudahkan orang awam yang ingin berterus berurusan dengan pihak JPJ seperti proses memperbarui lesen memandu. Datuk Yang Dipertua, sejak COVID-19 mula membarah di tanah air kita, pejawat awam ialah perawatnya yang setia yang menatang kita bagai sebuah keluarga tanpa jemu dan leka. Dalam mengharungi episod duka ini, anggota-anggota Barisan Harapan juga disambut keringat sukarelawan telah sama-sama menjayakan setiap agenda kerajaan dengan berkesan. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Terima kasih kami ucapkan. Oleh itu, bagi tahun hadapan, 
kerajaan bercadang untuk menambah baik beberapa kemudahan anggota perkhidmatan awam seperti berikut. Pertama, menurunkan kadar keuntungan skim pembiayaan komputer dan telefon pintar untuk berjawat awam daripada 4 kepada 2%. Kedua, memperuntukkan 365 juta ringgit antaranya bagi menyelenggara kuartus dan bangunan guna sama di bawah selian bahagian pengurusan hartanah. Ketiga, meneruskan inisiatif perlindungan kemalangan diri sehingga RM100,000 untuk manfaat 40,000 peminjam baru LPPSA. Skop perlindungan ini akan diperluas dengan penambahan tiga jenis perlindungan baru merangkumi hilang upaya separa, sebahagian dan kekal, badal haji serta perbelanjaan pemulihan kecederaan disebabkan kemalangan. Keempat, meningkatkan kadar bayaran insentif pengawasan banduan daripada RM150 kepada RM200 sebulan yang bakal memanfaatkan lebih RM14,000 pegawai penjara. Sebagai tambahan, allowance ini juga dipanjangkan kepada 775 pegawai kereta di institusi-institusi penjara yang terlibat dalam tugasan pengawasan banduan. Kelima, meningkatkan allowance penugasan sukarelawan simpanan polis atau PVR daripada RM7.80 kepada RM9.80 sejam untuk pegawai dan daripada RM6 kepada RM8 sejam untuk anggota. Kenaikan ini bakal memanfaat hampir 10,000 PVR. Dan keenam, membayar memberikan bayaran insentif sebanyak RM200 kepada pembantu pembangunan masyarakat grade S16 dan pembantu perawatan kebajikan grade U11 dan U14 yang bertugas di 24 institusi kebajikan atas jasa dan pengorbanan mereka yang terlibat secara langsung dalam perkhidmatan menjaga dan merawat penghuni warga emas, OKU dan pesakit mental. Dalam menangani krisis COVID-19, ramai pejawat awam, terutamanya barisan hadapan tetap komited kepada tugasannya dan antaranya tidak berpeluang bercuti. Bagi mengiktiraf pengorbanan tersebut, Sukacita diumumkan, gantian cuti rehat dinaikkan daripada maksimum 150 hari kepada 160 hari. Di samping itu, kerajaan juga akan melaksanakan kemudahan membenarkan penubusan awal GCR sehingga 50% atau 80 hari. Kemudahan ini mengambil kira keperluan pejawat awam seperti menunaikan haji atau membiayai pengajian tinggi anak. Bagi menghargai, menghargai jasa dan pengorbanan penjawat awam dalam menggalas tanggungjawab menyampaikan perkhidmatan kepada rakyat, terutamanya semasa negara mengharungi tempoh yang penuh cabaran ini, kerajaan mengumumkan bantuan khas kewangan kepada 1.3 juta penjawat awam grade 56 dan ke bawah sebanyak RM700 dan 1 juta pesara kerajaan sebanyak di RM350 dengan implikasi kewangan sebanyak RM1.3 bilion. Ringgit. Diharapkan semua bantuan ini dapat menjadi pemangkin kepada pejawat awam untuk terus berkhidmat dengan penuh dedikasi. Semua inisiatif yang dibentangkan pada hari ini tidak akan bermakna sekiranya pelaksanaannya tidak sampai kepada ahli keluarga Malaysia dengan tuntas dan berkesan. Sebuah itu... Yang amat berhormat Perdana Menteri akan mempergerusikan sebuah jawatan kuasa pemantauan yang diselaras oleh Kementerian Kewangan bagi memastikan semua inisiatif bajet 2022 berjaya mencapai objektif yang disasarkan. <tuh> Datuk Yang Dipertua, ahli-ahli yang berhormat, saudara saudari yang merupakan keluarga Malaysia kita. Kini, kini, Tiba kita di penghujung pembentangan ini. Hampir usai amanah yang diberikan, berlabuh kita di Muara Senja. Sauh sudah labuh, pendayung sudah sandar, mualim tak sabar menanti jeda. Maka berpeganglah kita pada ibrah yang terkandung dalam ayat 32 surah Al-Qalam. Setelah segala usaha, berserlah, berserlah, berserlahlah kita pada Yang Mahu. Berserahlah kita pada Yang Maha Esa. Semoga Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala menganugerahkan bagi kita sesuatu yang lebih baik daripada hari ini. Namun ketahuilah perjuangan menentang wabak ini belum berakhir. Nasib rakyat masih perih. Barisan hadapan kita belum pulang dari perbatasan ke pangkuan keluarga Malaysia. Peperangan masih membara di luar sana. Tapi kita sudah hampir di ambang kemenangan. Yakinlah kita dekat sekali. Cukup dekat. Justru dalam Dewan Yang Mulia ini, saya mohon ahli-ahli yang berhormat semua dukunglah belanjawan ini. Suara Tuan Puan, suara Tuan Puan ada hikmat 
melindung rakyat, memberi kita kudrat melawan musuh wabak durjana. Belanjawan ini kita tempah bersama. Kukuh bagai wajah.
6.24 p.m. That's right, Kong Yu with you since 2 p.m. today, bringing you a budget special, of course, with the unveiling and tabling of Budget 2022 uh, in Parliament. That's right, just had that presentation by our Finance Minister. Chris, uh, if you were tuning in continuously, uh, we also had a 10-minute brief roundup of the key parts or key components of the budget uh, during the special news bulletin as well. Yeah. So now about to launch into our conversation with my two special guests today. Right, I have with me since uh, 3 p.m., Ng Yin Sin, Founder and Chief Executive Officer of the Centre for Research, Advisory and Technology, CREATE, and also Associate Professor Nur Adli Rizwan Shah Muhammad Ali from the Faculty of Economics and Muamalat, University of Science Islam Malaysia, Usim, with me, uh, continuing our discussion right now. Uh, of course, getting the reactions of my two guests today on the budget. Yeah, so thank you so much for being with us. Uh, lady and gentlemen <laughs> and uh, yeah we're going to get right into things and uh, some key parts or key information of the budget first of all because uh, it's themed Gluaga Malaysia Matmo Sajatra by right, allocating 332.1 billion total right uh, of which of 233.5 uh, goes to the operating side of things 75.6 development uh, allocation uh, for development purposes right and much, much more. So let's talk about those first, okay? The key figures. Talked about expecting a bigger budget. So this also being the biggest ever, uh, if I'm not mistaken, right? So any reactions on that? Also on the allocations, uh, OPEX versus CAPEX. Prof? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <so> <laughs> yeah, just now we have actually um, discussed about our expectation about the budget. So we, we say that it is around 300 to 3, uh, I think it's three, mm -hmm. 350, right? Right. But, mm -hmm. but it actually uh, went up to 332. So it's wow. Wow in terms of that because uh, it's the biggest, right? It, uh, it's actually higher than uh, previous year. That's right. Right. So that's it. It's, yeah. yeah. I, I, mm. I was expecting it to be a bit, uh, larger than that. Slightly um, larger, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> correct. Yeah, maybe a little bit closer to the top range of uh -huh. 350, la, but okay, this is okay. about 332. It is the largest ever. Uh -huh. And I guess at the end, end of the day, we, we do still want to be a bit conservative in terms of our debt ratio and things like that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yinsen, any, any thoughts on the numbers per se? I, I think the uh, potential growth that we are looking at um, is also almost about the same like what we mentioned earlier. Yep. Um, but um, one thing that I mean, we, we haven't gotten, we, and in fact, we haven't gotten the time to actually do the calculation on the on the uh, you know That's right. the percentage uh, breakdown and all that. Yep. Mm -hmm. But looking at the way, you remember uh, during the pre-budget conversations that we had, we spoke about the need to create jobs, right? yes. create uh, jobs to as part of the recovery plan to bring unemployment down to you know pre-COVID time which is about four percent and that was like just exactly what the minister have said earlier mm -hmm. but um and and one thing that's consistent that we saw is that government is really creating jobs of up to six hundred thousand mm -hmm. of them mm -hmm. uh, so and, and if i remember screening this through very quickly is that i think uh, within the public sector and within the glcs uh the government is Creating jobs yeah. um, among those two sectors. Yeah, we talked about, I think, 4.8 billion allocated la, to, to yeah. actually this job creation of 600,000 opportunities, like you yeah. mentioned, right? So that's a that's a good sign there. So, so that would mean that uh, more emoluments, maybe? More expenditure? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so what, what we want, we really want to see what kind of jobs are being created apart from those um, that will be created uh, by the private sector. Mm. And we have to remember that the private sector, when, when the market comes back, when the economy becomes better, it is natural to have uh, to employ more people from the uh, private market, mm -hmm. and also the uh, multiple incentive like the salary subsidies mm -hmm. that the government is offering to private um, sectors who yeah, are recruiting from the tourism, unemployment. Tourism industry. No, it doesn't mean it doesn't mm -hmm. need to be. All. It, it, it covers across it covers many across, okay. industries. That's so right. those yeah. that part will definitely um, encourage employment from mm -hmm. the unemployed. Um, mm -hmm. People, uh, unemployed uh, community mm. but what I'm more interested in is the 80,000 more civil servants uh, positions uh, you know positions within the public sector that will be created it's something that uh, we, we should look at because I remember um, there were many conversations about our very heavy uh, public um, servants um, 
community that we have. Right. Right. And um, the introduction of another 80,000 mm -hmm. and more within the GLC. Mm -hmm. It's something that we would like to see. So let, let's see what, what are the meaningful job opportunities that will be offered to our fresh graduates or for the unemployed. Right. Yeah. I think it really uh, it will again boils down to the actual details. Lot, yeah. You know, of the placement and within which GLCs and, and, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that aside, of course, um, twenty-three billion that's allocated to to uh, still handling COVID, mm -hmm. per se. Um, well, any... half of the budget from the Ministry of Health will go to COVID expenditure, of which half goes mm. to procurement of vaccine, mm. and the other half would be on the PPEs and the immediate expenditure mm. to protect the frontliners. That's right. That, any... That's quite a fat one. That's quite a, a, a fat one, I could say. Yeah. Uh, any any uh, particular thoughts on the... We, we, we spoke, you mentioned as well, uh, the importance of the allocation towards the development side of things. Mm -hmm. And even you said infrastructure when it comes to health. Mm. Right, so I don't think we particularly had any. Yeah, no, no. Uh, yeah, not much details. Mm, details. Yeah. Not much details, but I think it's supposed to be in the uh, ministry RMK, budget. Uh, the uh, mm. nation plan, uh, twelve nation plan, mm -hmm. should be there, lah. Mm -hmm. We should have more hospitals. Okay, uh, we have to uh, uh, build more hospitals in, in certain places. Mm -hmm. So, but this budget, there is, uh, I mean, there is uh, none about the uh, development of hospital. It's more on procurement. Mm. Half of it goes to development, but yeah. the, but the details are not, not yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Whether it's on new hospitals, uh, out in rural areas, or, or upgrading. Or, that's or, right. We're not sure about those details. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but overall, of course, you know, they say health is uh, greatest wealth of all. So yeah. naturally, quite a lot of resources will go there. Okay. Uh, education yes, uh, continues the biggest, to take uh -huh. the biggest chunk, right? Fifty-two point six billion allocated. Sixteen percent. Mm -hmm. No, six percent. Is it? On How many percent? 16, 16%, 16 of That's the right. budget. But, right. but one thing that I would like to know is that I remember last year, mm. we also have allocated a large amount of um, funds to upgrade the dilapidated school. Mm. And I saw exactly the same the same, uh, the same thing that need to be done. So I wonder whether we, we carried forward what was being allocated last year right. but not done due to COVID that because right. there's no renovation construction allowed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. therefore it has been carried forward to this year and it appeared again in mm. the budget but however if work if upgrading work for schools were being done last year and whatever over the last 18 months then it will be interesting for us to see how many dilapidated schools in Malaysia that needs to be fixed. Otherwise, <laughs> it keeps popping up in every, budget, right, every right. year's budget. I have a feeling yeah. it is more towards the former because, you know, like we were saying, you know, we didn't, we didn't foresee this third wave, right, which really uh, closed down a lot of uh, uh, Malaysia, yeah? Uh, so it could be probably the, you know, that was the allocated for <laughs> last year per se on that perspective. Mm -hmm. But then again, education, you know, does, and uh, you know, take up the main chunk of the budget as it has been uh, and as I want to touch about the three points yeah the three main uh, sections like shall we say of the budget which is basically um, on protecting the Iraqis uh, well-being overall of course in keeping businesses resilient mm -hmm. which is also uh, super important and keeping the economy as prosperous as possible yeah uh, quite a challenge uh, in the, the balancing of of it all right and also uh, one thing that struck me, I'm not sure, because, you know, in terms of maybe uh, the numbers and you mentioned tourism, right, Prof? 1.6 billion, I think, uh, that was allocated to uh, tourism per se. Um, is that enough? I, I can't quantify that number. To me, it seems it's not as sizable as it can be. Okay, um, mm. basically, if you look at tourism, that 1. 1.6, I'm not yes. really sure about that. Right. Uh, there are, f I mean, four initiatives in the tourism, which is uh, the oh, waste subsidy, right? And then you have this uh, uh, special financing for the tourism industry, and also I think three, right? So and then the um, special um, uh, assistant for the uh, uh, tourism, right? So uh, one point six billion is about one thousand six hundred million, right? So I think it's quite. Uh, reasonable okay because if we look at 2020 uh, projected what call it income from tourism is about 100 billion mm. 100 billion right so uh, they are trying to spend about 1.6 billion okay mm. to get about um, 100 billion is I, I think it's quite relatively small 
but uh, at least there are uh, some some the budget is being allocated. For sure, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. just it struck me as yeah. in my layperson's perspective, like, oh, okay, I thought it would be bigger. I think it's six hundred million towards AIDS uh, per se, financial AIDS and, and things yeah. like that. Uh, and uh, uh, f- and you can see this is interesting. 50 million towards improving infrastructure of tourism per se. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that yeah. one is for... Yeah, yeah. To, to upgrade Up- uh, sites yeah. and destinations. Yeah. So, right. the devils is always in the details. We, we really yeah. don't know. Yeah. So Again, once yeah. again, we always speak about the context of how we need to <laughs> reposition, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. So, obviously, a lot of it has to do with infrastructure uh, uh-huh. investment. Yes, that will be upgrading necessary. of what we have. Mm. Upgrading of the... Tourism product that that's we right. Have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because f- I, I, this, uh, d- but, but this is go- they are going to give it in term of grants, right? The grant uh, is the matching grant for oh. boutique hotels and okay. all that uh-huh. for them to upgrade uh-huh. their uh-huh. rooms yeah, and yeah, their yeah, premises. Yeah. But uh-huh. this one is another fifty million for to yeah. upgrade the infrastructure uh-huh. of okay. that particular site. That's uh-huh. right. Itself. Uh-huh. Yeah. So we we don't know how many qualify for correct qualify mm-hmm. for this. Um, mm-hmm. Upgrading yeah. uh, grant, and it's really interesting because I, I really feel that the 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 point that you had, which is basically how to reposition uh, all of this, but of course it would involve infrastructure reinvestment costs, upgrading costs, and all that. But more importantly, it's the 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 task of doing that, la. Yeah. You know, in, okay, you upgrade it, but it has to be with the purpose of how you reposition it. Yeah, and, and, you, and remarket it. Yeah, and you look mm. at number six of tourism. Yeah, mm. to give, uh, I mean, to to give matching grant to companies. Uh, that organi- uh, that which will organize um, arts and culture related programs so 50 million ringgit matching grant what does that mean mm. yeah because for companies to do that uh, what kind of what under what circumstances would a matching grant uh, be, be relevant be issued yeah, yeah. because mm. you know because it's a company doing it that you see it's not government or agencies mm-hmm. doing that so yeah. So this is one to one grant, or we don't yeah, know is, what is, is the detail. The it, detail is not there. Yeah, no detail. It's right. just say so matching grant. Uh-huh. Yeah, how so do you match? We it can know. be one to one grant, or maybe it can be to I mean, fifty uh, percent or whatever. Right. So, uh, so we don't know. We don't know. There are a lot of we don't know kind uh, of thing okay. in the tourism industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there's no details. Right. Uh, overall, forty billion dedicated to reviving uh, businesses and also you know. The, keeping businesses as resilient as possible within the context of a prosperous economy. Like all these <laughs> crossed uh, our purposes, right? Uh, any particular thoughts on that? Uh, I've here because 1.8 billion allocated uh, to informal or micro businesses. Um, this is in terms of um, uh, loans, right? 0% up to one year of mm-hmm. uh, for repayment. Uh, this is small uh, business loans for the micro businesses, lah. Or informal oh, businesses. Oh, the up to the up to ten thousand, thirty five thousand, man, right? That's so right. Micro, yes. micro. micro. So yeah. for yeah. anybody who would like to just uh-huh. jump on board and start their own small scale business, mm. you see that is the danger. Mm. Because of a grant, you start something because mm. you want a grant. Mm. Then, uh, from a business perspective, that we need to see whether that particular business is sustainable or, or even viable in the viable. first place. Yeah. Right? So I so again, the devil is in the details. We don't know what is the qualifying mm. uh, requirement. Or policies that the government will put in to uh, to govern mm-hmm. the giving out of such aid. Yeah, uh, interesting. It's going to be. It is a nice uh, effort, lah. Right, because it does yes. give people that whole idea of you can do a side gig. I guess. Yeah. The the. The the key fundamentals that you got to choose your side gig properly. Uh yes, mm-hmm. and um I would call this a micro credit or micro financing for small business. Mm-hmm. But again, um I really would like to I really wouldn't want to see um this micro finance f- to help or to save smaller businesses will turn into a bad debt, mm. and the government will have to write it off. Mm-hmm. Well, well, well uh, we we need to see that. Okay, because the uh, one of the um, initiative is through Teco, no? Okay, mm-hmm. and then they are using debt financing. What I want to uh, propose, okay, if Teco actually can uh, look into is uh, partnership uh, base. You know, we call it the uh, diminishing partnership, which means that you provide capital to the uh, entrepreneurs. And at the end of the, you ha, you are you 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 are in the we call it JV lah. You do a JV with the the small businesses, 
and the businesses will actually pay uh, up their capital okay the part of the capital from from day one until the end of the tenure and then at the end of the day okay okay the business will have 100 percent capital right so that is actually another way definitely of, 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 that would be the ideal of 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 to pay back uh, to get know, repayment to yeah. get repayment yeah but that is actually uh different from that base mm. it's mm-hmm. actually a uh, equity base mm. mm-hmm. right equity base it's just like a uh, stock market lah yeah. but it's for smaller smaller what you call it um, ownership yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah but mm. you see i think if we can com- if we want to compare the SMEs and SMIs mm-hmm. with the public listed i think we are ex- we are actually not comparing apple to apple yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah. we know that the requirements no, I'm just giving that yeah the governance yeah. of yeah. a public listed mm. and the smaller yeah. mom and pop shop is is yes, very yes. different yep. yeah speaking of which right i mean did you both notice any particular i mean uh, you know i must have i may have missed it like we're talking about you know, micro businesses here right mm. uh, financing for uh, you know anybody to in a way get involved mm. in a site gig uh, si- uh, gig economy as long as again we choose wisely <laughs> that is very important right mm. Uh, for SMEs per se, right? In terms of allocations and incentives, right? Was there and was there a main emphasis on this, or was it sort of scattered all over, depending on which which industries we're talking about? I didn't pick up on much of that. For SMEs, I think uh, mm. in terms of uh, in the second initiative, right? uh, for the financing, it would have fall, uh, fallen under. So I uh, um, did not actually managed to like i said you know from the presentation just now pick up on an emphasis on smes uh, not, per se not heavy, other than uh, micro and yeah it, it's not uh, heavy exactly there's no heavy emphasis on that but but we see uh, a bit more focus uh have been given to the e-commerce space mm-hmm. uh people who uh who work in the informal sector mm. being able to also take up a loan or qualify for uh, qualified to apply for housing loan and things like that, and gu- the government will guarantee it. So, uh, of course, all this will be higher fiscal risk, seriously, if I take on the very conservative banking position. Mm-hmm. But I guess the, the what the government also would like to do is to also ensure that the developers and people in the construction industry, you know, get to also get back on their feet because they have also been affected right. very badly during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think we have to be very careful because the last thing that we want is to ensure the development and construction industry to prosper. But then on the other hand, we give, we qualify people who shouldn't we qualify mm. because we want to promote home ownership. We, you know, in the name of some other reasons and justification, we open up a floodgate for you know for for the country to bear a higher fiscal risk uh, you know that's that's something that right. i think we should be quite mm-hmm. careful right, right. But i think uh, it's here okay uh, as, as you know that it actually doesn't mention uh, the smes but if you look at uh, the second initiative on uh, uh, empowering the business right so yep. uh, it's under uh, financing and also alternative financing, right? So there are about fourteen billion, okay, fourteen bil- fourteen point two billion uh, ringgit is actually uh, accessible uh, for the SMEs, mm-hmm. and also for uh, for uh, SMEs also. I think initiative three, okay, for guarantees on financing. Mm-hmm. So basically, business they want to do business, and then for example, they use trade uh, letter of credit or whatever, so they, have, they have to have these guarantees, right? Hmm. So there are also guarantees, okay, from um, SJPP. Okay, this is about 10 billion, right? 10 billion. So uh, I think there are some some of it for SMEs. It's okay? a, yeah. And also for micros. Yeah. Okay, and also uh, really interesting is for public listed also. Yeah. Public listed companies also, uh, they have this, what I call it, the, what do I call billion. it? 3 billion, right? Yeah. Three billion in uh, what's the uh, three billion? Uh, it's actually to, to equity financing. To, uh, uh, yeah, uh-huh. no, no, it's called a JV, JV, JV. equity. Uh-huh. Okay. By one of the GLC yeah. or government will come in and yes, yes, uh, um, bail you out or help you with your cash flow, whatever, mm-hmm. and then it becomes right. part 
JV. Oh, you look at it, small, yeah, then uh-huh. the, the part ownership, right? So yeah. I guess, you know, there's incentive for that, uh, just to be fair across the board. But, but really, three billion yeah. for the entire yeah. public listed <laughs> exactly. company. Exactly. Yeah. Like, everybody on Bursa is, is, <laughs> is actually very small. Yeah, it's just that, yeah. you know, okay, you know, we, let's not forget that we've got the public listed companies as well. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's so more in that feel, I think. I think, I think what It should be going to the SMEs or, or even smaller scale uh, uh, businesses yeah. per se. But, la. but maybe what what the government is saying is that, you know, it's, it's all about balance and who you want to build first when you have limited resources, mm-hmm. right? So perhaps the public listed company would have a larger trickling down effect and impact towards the greater society mm-hmm. <coughs> and economy. Mm-hmm. Therefore, more assistance will be given to that sector that will potentially affect more people because there certainly a public listed company will uh, employ more yep. people. Mm-hmm. So they provide jobs. So we have to first protect the business. Then we can protect jobs and protect the people. Yes. So maybe that is the approach. The, yes, and that, that <laughs> brings up something else though. I mean, I guess I'll bring it up now. Um, that was uh, revealed towards the end of the presentation. The prosperity tax. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not so familiar. <laughs> I'm not familiar with ex- ex- actual amounts that which are currently existing, right? Mm-hmm. Now, this Chukai Makmo, yeah. right, is going to be imposed on companies bringing in revenue. Above. Re- uh, no. Revenue. Is it profit or revenue? Profit. Uh, no, profit. 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 No, 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 no. no. Uh, one second. Like, uh? Yeah, profit. Chukai pendapatan. Yeah. Profit, eh? Profit. Pendapatan, not, not revenue, eh? Uh, no, no. Revenue is the sales, okay? Revenue is sales. <coughs> is actually, so you get uh, 24%? Of uh, above 100 million, right? Uh-huh. Okay, and then you'll be taxed at 24%. Um, and then for anything above, I believe it's 33%. 33%, 33%. But, yeah. But what does it mean, actually? This is actually one of, like, for example, yeah, we can call it a windfall tax. But la. it's uh-huh. different, right? Okay, no, so no, sorry, Prof. Can I, can I seek clarification? So uh-huh. it says that uh, sehingga 100 juta. Okay. So anything below, below, below? You, you are not you are not taxed twenty. From where to where? So from if the first threshold is hundred million, so from where to hundred million you get twenty four percent. Uh, so so should be uh for the first one hundred ringgit. No, 100, the first one hundred. One hundred million. So the first for one hundred and one million, the one million will be taxed. Okay. Uh. A twenty four percent, yeah. So anything below hundred million is still the same. Is falling yeah. under the normal taxes. Normal tax. And anything above hundred million so uh, will. No, no. Yeah, yeah. See, it's supposed. To, yeah, the because ringgit pertama. Yeah. So the ringgit, first hundred million. Uh, no, the ringgit pertama after one hundred million. Okay, then where does the thirty three fall? No, uh, that no, no, one, Prof. You see, sehingga seratus juta ringgit pertama. Huh. So that means the first hundred million. Okay, so hingga satu juta okay, okay. Akan dikenakan okay, this is, <laughs> We need to this. So, so we need to say if okay. my company makes five million, five million. I'm going right. to get twenty four percent tax. Uh huh. Uh huh. That's uh-huh. very high. Okay. That's a big jump, you know. All right. So it almost uh, like, where is the minimum threshold? It's not specifically okay. spelled out, right? hundred juta pertama. That's the thing. Okay. Well, that's going to be something interesting for us to look into because it it, it does make a difference whether first hundred million. Anybody who makes above a certain we amount. We need to understand what is uh, that this this statement means. Yeah. Okay? All right. So we can't say anything right now. <laughs> so, sehingga 100 juta pertama pendapatan yeah. cukai sehingga 100 juta. So pertama. this why it's just we will have to KIV it because uh, of the. the I was we'll start fighting. We can <laughs> we can make clarity out of the text, <clears throat> but I yeah. this to me coming mm. at towards the end of the the presentation, and also to business owners generally lah. Mm-hmm. It comes to me as like okay i'm not sure well, how people will take to it well i think for um smaller businesses or even business as a whole mm. if you want to recruit again a recruit you know uh, hire more people then the government is really giving incentive this time around because if you hire from the unemployed pool of people but of course i don't know what is the definition of unemployment maybe one month three months six months one, one year yeah. then you yeah. qualify into mm-hmm. to be part of that so if if let's say i recruit 10 people from the unemployed group or whatever amount, then I actually qualify for salary subsidies mm. um, of 6 months to 12 months. So it goes in tiered percentage, which can make things quite um, 
uh, attractive. Mm -hmm. And for example, for interns as well, interns coming from the higher education sector, um, as long as they are below 30 years old, they are a full-time student in an institution, so I can also hire them and I get salary um, subsidi subsidy from the government of up to 900 ringgit. And this is really, really very interesting and attractive. Because mm -hmm. in the past, one of the challenge for smaller companies to hire interns is that, one, of course, if you're just a student, you may not be as savvy. So the, the rate of um, internship recruitment is not as high as we would hope for. But then with this salary subsidy, then I'm sure it will also encourage the private sector to give more opportunity to younger people to learn, you know, some hands-on experience while they are still uh, in university. Right. Yeah. So it allows that. Uh, it, yeah, it allows for it that. It enables yeah. for that. So it yeah. really now is in the hands of uh, the actual company itself. Okay, I, I yeah. think I, I understand what your statement means about the 24% okay. mm. tax. Mm. Okay. Basically, uh, until 100 million, mm. it's still the same 24%. Because previously was mm. also is it is also twenty four percent corporate tax corporate tax twenty four percent, so above one hundred million for which is one hundred and one ring uh, million and one ringgit, that one ringgit will be taxed at thirty three percent, right? Okay. So the 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 actual additional tax is really on the anything the, that's above hundred million. Hundred million, yeah. Uh, in terms what of what about the paid up capital part, the two point five million paid up. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. We'll need to KIV that. Okay. We'll ask some tax advisors. Okay, yeah, <laughs> that's right. We'll need to KIV that for now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, oh, something interesting. Yes. I'd I like to uh, just point out. Go ahead. RPGT. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, the RPGT that everybody hates. Mm. Yeah. So, if you sell your house um, after the fifth year, then you won't get the real property gain tax. I think that's a good news mm -hmm. for yeah. a lot of homeowners who, like, who would like to, to you know, sell and then uh -huh. buy a new one. So we, we should see some liquidity right. in the market, in the secondary market. I think that's the so key. I mean, we, we just need to, to have some liquidity but, overall. Well, that's, that's uh -huh. the part of, point of investment, right? Yeah. If I buy something at a million today and I sell it six years later, if I sell at 1.2 million, it, I merely get 20% increase in my uh, in, in my investment. Mm -hmm. So if that also have to be taxed, then nobody would want to yeah. be investing in the property sector. Right, right. And that also, like I said, the key is to get some liquidity going in yes. the property mm -hmm. sector, yes, which, it, so been so, yeah. which has been uh, uh, so stagnating for the past two, three years. Yeah, yes. Liquidity base, la, not yeah, in terms of uh, value or anything. Yes, per that's se. very important. Yeah. Um, oh, good news. Good news. La. Yeah. <laughs> so anybody who want to buy a car, Ah. Sales tax um, has been uh, is continued to continued, be taken away okay, yeah. because this year also no sales tax yeah. for CBD for yeah CBD CBD four hundred percent for CBD no C, uh, C, CBD CKD 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 CKD, CKD. <laughs> CKD, CKD. Yeah. Uh, yeah that just yeah. makes things easier uh, uh. Then fifty percent fifty percent for the fully imported that's yeah. right for car yeah. ownership overall right uh, exactly yeah. but uh, however if you buy an EV you get more more promo <laughs> yes. so you don't have like sales tax I think road tax also have like either it's free or something yeah not quite sure about the actual uh, maintenance I mean they always say people yeah. EVs you know but you also get subsidies on the battery ah. which is quite interesting ah, you look like you're targeting an EV no I'm just saying I'm yeah. just saying okay. well, targeting just, for shopping yeah. but that's something that you know uh, just, keep things going just EV maybe yeah. in Sydney is targeting <laughs> a new car overall now there's a no. business traveller centre thing I know it's not mm -hmm. uh, on the total amount of allocation to I guess to, to, to convert a, a, a place to the business traveler center uh it, in terms of the numbers there, they're not s that big mm -hmm. but i think it's an interesting initiative right yeah yeah, yeah. so they're putting in one up in uh KLA, 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 yeah. and then one in uh johor i believe uh -huh. right so that it enables uh, i don't know how they're going to manage it because no quarantine yeah for so, so certain that's, business that's, travelers they want to solve the problem of quarantine yeah okay so people to 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 i mean meet right to meet so yeah. i believe that it, we are not the locals but the international uh, business uh, travelers. For sure. But are they going to be there then? then they, they weren't going to be there. For example, they would have to be in that area and they can only do business there. Uh, a businessman from Indonesia right. and also a businessman from Vietnam, they come to KLA. And they meet there. They meet there, do meeting, okay. then they go back. Without Singapore quarantine. does that. Mm. Singapore mm. does that. Okay. Yeah. Right. They call it um, a green zone or something. Oh. So yeah. you cannot leave that zone. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I like that because it just makes things practical. Yeah. 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 Right? Without having to go through the, the, the 10 days quarantine, yeah, yeah. let's say, or 14 yeah. days, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a small thing, but I think this is where we're talking about making things practical. We yep. spoke a lot about that during the mm -hmm. pre-budget discussion, right? Mm -hmm. Where, you know, a lot of um, where 
the issues are really are just gaps mm -hmm. of mm. you know, people getting in touch with each other, the relevant SMEs getting in contact with the right agency to enable whatever it is that needs to be en enabled, mm. whether it's transfer technology or maybe sometimes it's just pure financing uh, related issues. Yeah. Um, so seven hundred million for Jendela, which is the digitization network initiative, right? Loosely mm -hmm. translated, thirty million only, right, to serve the forty PP army. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm specifically no, no, no. picking um, up Hong on you, this. Mm -hmm. I, yep. I think, okay. I think that uh, I, I cannot find which page is that that's go that goes under. Uh, right. But we have to remember right. that we spent um, a lot of money <laughs> to build the one Malaysia internet center. I think this is just an upgrade of the existing centers. Mm. Because most of the then Satu Malaysia in Pusat Internet uh, were all being built, almost all of them uh, is, are actually near a PPR or underneath a PPR lot. Okay. So, um, I, so I, I, I can't remember. Then the people question people would here be, like, you're talking yeah, about yeah, the, so an upgrading. the 30 million is in your viewpoint that upgrading. goes for the upgrading it's an upgrading to existing centers okay but the question is is that enough we're talking about you know the okay. the big need and the urgent push towards getting malaysia as connected as possible mm -hmm. so that all the pusat internet have internet okay but that means it is only applicable to the, the area that is the ppr per se la. correct right okay yeah. then unless we are building more pusat internet but it's called something else right yeah okay then um the the, the Allocation towards or the focus towards the areas which are not under coverage. Um, I think that is also under Jandela. It should be under Jandela, right? Yeah, the that five, the five, the installation of five G. Five G, seven hundred yeah, yeah. million that's that's dedicated towards that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm, but I'm, I'm really not sure whether it's coming out from the national budget or it's under a separate that's right. MCMC fund mm. that the telco actually pay for uh, under a special tax. Yeah. So I'm just curious as to whether that is um, mm. sufficient, lah, especially with this urgent push towards. You know, getting all things online, right? And yeah. and of course, uh, being able to have people access uh, mm. the internet in the first place is yeah. the first major fundamental. Okay, yeah. so that's something to think yeah, about. Yeah, this six hundred pusat economy digital. Mm. Uh, I believe they are the existing um, pusat internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, interesting thoughts there. Yeah? yeah. So yeah, we covered uh, a few of the key highlights here. Any uh, particular ones uh, that we have not uh, spoken about uh, in the lead up to seven pm? Uh, just um, about four minutes away from now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel that the government um, are giving recognition to the civil society organizations and the, and you know the NGOs who have been contributing significantly during the pandemic when um, the public sector cannot cope with whatever that needs to be done or when the society needs to be fixed and help. Therefore, we saw um, Grand, right? NGOs and civil society getting more. Um, space mm -hmm. in participating in tenders mm -hmm. um, and then uh, grants mm -hmm. for NGOs who are working within the mental health space, uh, within capacity building and all that to so, so meaning to say the NGOs will be better funded to do work for the community. Mm -hmm. in a, uh, you know, that, that's in a nutshell what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually um, very happy to see um, a sizable allocation being given to mental health care. Remember, we spoke about that the mental health of fraternity is very much underinvested in this country. Yep. And I think this is the first time, mm. if not the second time, we see increased budget to allow people to be able to seek treatment mm. and to recognize if they need help. Right. I think uh, that would definitely um, help uh, or support more people, uh, facilitate uh, more people to be to want to go and seek help, you see. Okay. That, that's very important. Interesting yeah. thought, right? Any closing observations from you, Prof? Well, uh, I believe that this is one of the biggest, we we'll call it budget, okay? Uh, when we are looking at, we're trying to overcome the COVID and also we are trying to make sure that the business uh, community is also uh, moving forward in the uh, economic uh, development and also to ensure okay all the socio economic or demographic uh, of the nation people i think it, this is quite comprehensive okay but we want to see how it's actually being implemented firstly it need to be passed mm. okay it need to be agreed that's right in the parliament yes. so this is actually like okay uh, this is the the proposal, proposal right yes. then mm -hmm. then uh, the parliament will need to to uh, to uh, pass it okay mm -hmm. uh, and then the another thing is that 
implementation. Okay, so the implementation implementation stage is very very crucial. As always, so yes. uh, so that it's actually can be delivered. Okay, to the people. Okay, hundred percent or maybe hundred and ten percent, right? So then we will get the benefit. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, and as closing, right? Let's say we're going to rate this. Uh, you guys, that's, that's it. On a scale of one to ten, in terms of your wowness to it, Yinsin. Wow, I got BM tax. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an English tax. One, one to ten in terms of how much you've been wowed. Well, I would say that I, I can see that the government is really spreading things quite thinly. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, one thing to note is that the disabled community uh, really mm-hmm. have got more things because that's, that's, right. that's really, a, I wouldn't call it a sector, but a community okay. that we have forgotten. Uh, yeah. Aborigines. Oh. All right. Yeah. Yes. So aborigines as well. So we did. We do need to wrap up. So yeah. one to ten. Uh, one to ten. I don't know. I can't <laughs> count today. It's getting late. But anyway, I'll be back on Monday. Prof. <laughs> I think in terms of comprehensive. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I can say it's about eight. Okay. Eight. Really, uh, really comprehensive. All right. Trying to go into further. What I call it? I mean. All the details. All the details. That's right. All right. right. We've run out of time. Thank you so much right. to my two guests. I was kind of thinking we may not be uh, speaking so much, but. Obviously, you have a lot of opinions to share. Thank you so much. Ng Yin Sin, founder and CEO of Create, as well as Associate Professor Noad Lee Rizwan uh, from uh, USIM, with us right here on a budget special on Attracts FM. Stay tuned. Lots more to come. Head it your way, including your first right now leading direct into news at 7 p.m. Stay tuned right here on Tracks FM.